Constellation, Last Stand Media's conversational podcast, is brought to you by you. If you want to learn how to support our podcast network, head to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Constellation, Last Day Media's conversational podcast. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan Moriarty, who apparently has better places to be today. How are you today, Dagan? <laughs> no, this is the this is the place. <laughs> this is where I want to be. Yeah, I was just telling the boys I have to exit like, depending on how this one goes, right? Halfway through, two thirds of the way through. So I'm going to miss some of it. But I have two hours of quality time to spend with you guys. Does me good to see you. I love these smiling faces. Does me Brad good to see you coming to us in the wee hours of the morning from the yeah. West Coast. Ten a.m. <laughs> Real early here. <laughs> I've been awake for twenty five minutes. So, yeah. <laughs> fair enough, dude. I've been hell diving. I know, mm. man. Good. I can't stop hell diving. I know. I really I'm sorry for. I I'm sorry. Sorry for hell diving. Oh, I wonder okay. if people are going to get the reference. I, I named the newest episode of Sacred Symbols that went up today when we're recording this. Sorry for hell diving, which is a reference to the LMAO, LFMAO record. Sorry for party rocking, which I always thought was the funniest name of a record ever. You know, because then they do a song called Party Rock or something or an album. And then they release yes. something called Sorry for Party Rocking, which I think is so I always thought the thought that was so funny. So fantastic. I named it Sorry for Hell Diving. And then Dustin remade the album cover, which is like an iconic album cover. Um yeah, as well so out. but i want but the reason i did that brad and welcome to the show is because you named your episode of summon sign hell diving so mm -hmm. i named our so the next episode that would go i would say sorry for hell diving which is <laughs> which i thought was weird. but i don't think people are that's like too meta i think that for most people meta. to get um so oh my god it actually is your stomach <laughs> not anymore yeah, it, is. <laughs> oh, it is it is yeah, for people unhinged that don't know the, thumbnail. Yeah, yeah the record the re people should go look up the lmfao record uh cover for Sorry for party rocking, and you'll see the reference. Brad, welcome to the show. How are you today, my friend? Good, man. Just ate some waffles, so I'm feeling real good right now. Like real waffles Ooh. or no, Lego? Or just like Lego, uh, not Lego, Ego, Ego waffles. Trader Joe's waffles, but they're oh, okay. Belgian style. Oh, they're nice. Okay. Wrong. They're good. I didn't yeah. know if you got out the iron. You no, know? fuck no, dude. Fucking That's going way off. too much work right now. That's way too much work right now. Brad's going off, making waffles. Mr. Matty Plays, good to see you. Oh. I can see your room a little bit better now. So you have natural light in this room? Yes. Oh, yeah. looks, it looks great. The snow uh, is helping too. It snowed a lot. So oh. a little bit of reflection from the sun off the snow. Cool. Because so, yeah. I have windows right here, like right next to me, but I got blackout blinds on them because mm -hmm. I don't know if people remember I when we first got cameras. Well. I was like getting the sun would move and then it would slowly blind me during the show. Yeah. <laughs> so I, had to, I had to do something about that. I'm sorry, Maddie, you were saying something. Oh, no, no, you're good. Yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, Yeah, I, I, for me, it's I, I'm lucky the sun never blows directly into the room. So I do have blackout curtains for when I want to just like be a complete hermit. Um, But right now it's it's working out pretty well for me. My dogs are barking. I apologize. Let me no, uh, okay. shut my door. <laughs> Pop it off. He's standing up for the audio listeners. He stood up and shut his door. All right, I see somebody's back. legs. This is insane. Yeah. It's like a I muscle will cover me when I stepped away, but it was just silence. <laughs> But yeah, no, no I, I, I really I like how I set things up here. So I think it looks great. And I was Thank describing you. for the audio listeners what you were doing, because sometimes Cog mm. is especially one to put something in the chat and then just disappear. Like, because he has to go do something. And, <laughs> it, looks like he's just, demo, yeah. and it looks like he's just tired of listening to everyone. Like he just gets up and leaves. So I always have to like tell the audience, like, please don't think that that's the case. Well, it's good to be here with you guys today. Um, I'm feeling good. I have I've been playing a lot of good games and mm -hmm. uh, been hell diving, been playing uh, banishers which i think is really awesome the the setting of that game is fucking awesome it's 17th century massachusetts um and you're like a and you're a ghost hunter have you, have you played vampire by chance no i haven't and i was actually I'm talking about that on like sacred that. yeah is it is does it feel the same kind of like that kind of chunky action yeah, yeah. It, i would i would describe it as that i liked vampires combat more than most because i thought the if anyone's played Vampire, the dodge in that game is sick. Like it's so smooth. You just disappear into dust and then reappear. Like Alucard. It's awesome. Oh, yeah, I, I love it. This. But it uh that game it was one of my favorite RPGs from last gen. I really thought it was good. So I, I had my eye on banishers, but I just didn't have the time because I've been reviewing a couple other things like Skull and Bones. <laughs> so you're actually playing it. It's real. <sighs> it is real. It's not 
It's not very good. <laughs> really? Well, that's so if you look at it in a Shocking. if you look at it in a bubble, right? Like if you look at it in a bubble, it's perfectly fine. But when you look at like Assassin's Creed three, four, Rogue, when you look at that, and then what other things they were doing beyond the ship combat? By the way, the ship combat in those games I think is authentically better than what Skull and Bones does, just by like design. Like they bring the camera in Skull and Bones way too close, so when you like go to shoot a ship, you can't see anyone else. So like you have no spatial awareness, so you just immediately are fucked. Uh, once you engage in combat and uh, a lot of the combat scenarios are like one on three, one on four. So it's just it kind of collapses on itself. But yeah, it's um, in comparison, not very good, uh, especially for how long it's in development. It makes you wonder, like, why it had to exist, what the goal was. Uh, $70. There's a lot of Indeed. there are a lot of theories that it had to be completed because of tax purposes, right? In wherever it's being made in Malaysia yes. or whatever, yeah. which is sense. so strange yeah. to me just because you think. If it was that big of a deal, Ubisoft could have been like, we'll just pay you back. Like, <laughs> like whatever loan we got, we'll just pay you back. Because they're, they're tr- in East Asia, they're trying to do a lot of the Quebec style, you know, gleaming money from the government. I mean, that's that's uh, Ubis- Ubisoft's really sur- a lot of studios or publishers survive off of these things from Ontario, from Quebec and so on. And so sure, forth. So, yeah. And Dayton, that's I know it's the same in the animation world, too. And that's, oh, yeah. I don't necessarily mind that, especially with these. um did you see the new open AI thing with the making basically videos now? It's like, it's over. Yeah. yeah. You know? It's really? over. the puppies in the snow. Yeah. It's I over. saw the Microsoft. I think it was a Super Bowl commercial of just like, Hey, if you can't do it, guess who can AI. And, and like they had people punching in, like, make me a dragon storyboard. Uh, help me make an open world game. I'm just like, are you fucking serious? <laughs> yeah. It's like, fucked. I mean, is, it's, it's, it's nuts, fucked. Man. And, um, you know, it's everyone, it everyone really is fucked because people, people, it's funny, man. This is a, an aside, but people think when I say that it's like, oh, well, they're coming for your job now and now you care. And it's like, I don't think you understand that's a, a, irrelevant to me. My job's not going anywhere. I don't know if you guys know that. Like <laughs> speaking about things is is a pretty safe thing. You can put me in a fucking AI machine and make it sound like me. It's for sure. At one point, you could probably have a computer do an episode of Sacred Symbols at one point. But nonetheless, I'm going to be here. I'm not saying it from a self-preservation point of view at all. No, and people think I'm also saying it for a self-preservation point of view for my brother. But I'm not. I'm saying it because I'm a fucking human being. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and one of the only things that separates us from the animals is our ability to like your whole self consciousness and your and your ability to see the world. There's an ama- for, I'll give you an example. There's an amazing artifact from probably 50,000 years ago, a Cro-Magnon artifact from when they first from when people first started intermixing with Neanderthals and all the rest in Europe. And it's a human figure with a lion's head carved in wood. People mm. can go look it up. That concept alone is considered one of the greatest turns in consciousness ever because it's the first time that we see an animal being able to understand something outside of itself, fuse things together. It's, it's a wildly human thing, thing and, we're, and we're offloading it to computers like it's math. It's very weird to me. And then you have people like Jaffe, God bless them, who root it on. Where I'm like, what are you fucking, why? Because you got yours already or something? I don't understand that. Mm. You know, um, you want someone to, and do these AI artists, and I've said this before on one of these shows, I want to fucking strangle these motherfuckers. I created, <laughs> look what I created by putting a prompt in. You didn't create dick. And I want to be damn ass clear about that. You didn't create anything. You didn't create shit. You're as much of an artist as I am. Yeah, it's a yeah. Google search. It's that's fucking a, that's bullshit. A, right. Yeah. Oh, right. Pay, pay me a beautiful Renaissance painting. Hmm, I wonder how it knows what a Renaissance painting is. <laughs> no, that's you know, just a natural fact dude. of life. A law, a natural law, the fifth law of the universe. Renaissance paintings, you know, electrodynamics and all, whatever, electromagnetism rather, and the strong force and the weak force and all that, and Renaissance paintings. That's that's in the fucking fabric, just like math. It, oh! Dude, I'm there with you. It's like a weekly debate on Duke. Like, not that Cog's pro AI, but like we talk about it all the time. And I'm just like, you can't strip that human element out of creativity. Like that commercial for Microsoft was no way. straight up advocating like, hey, you can't do it. Like you still can't do it, but a computer can do it. Like there was no encouragement beyond that. Like just let the computer do it. I'm like, guys, it's like, like the, this doesn't get you. This doesn't make you better. Also, consider this. No matter how good you are, people are like, oh, what about a calculator or an abacus and all that kind of stuff? You know, some of the earliest writings you see in like Babylonian in, in Babylon or whatever in, Bab- in, in the Babylonian civilization are like, you know, um, basically I have seven bushels of fucking wheat and all this kind of shit. It's like that doing that kind of math 
and then doing the stuff you see like goodwill hunting doing on the on the on the uh, chalkboard calculators aren't going to help you do that you either need to know how to do it or you don't know how to do it this idea that like you can't you don't know anything about writing or you don't know anything about art and then you're just gonna insert yourself into that is preposterous and yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, and it bothers me a great deal again not people miss i think some people misunderstand is like this protective thing i don't think it's a protective thing i think it's fucking sad I think it's robotic. I think we might as well plug ourselves in at this point. If if they, if they are truly going to take that away from us, then there's almost no point in living. I don't want to well, play music. I don't want to. And I really lose not Jaffe so much because he's talking about it more from a philosophical point of view. But I've heard I've talked to some developers where they use this stuff already. Like, oh, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I don't I really this. respect you that much anymore. <laughs> like, I know people that use it, put writing prompts into mid journey and get pictures back to like inspire them as they're writing. I'm like, well, that's you have already you're cheating, dude. And then yeah. people will be like, oh, uh, you get inspired by things. And I'm like, yeah, it's not mechanized, dummy. It's not fucking mechanized. When I go when I go to look at the Mona Lisa and get inspired by it, I don't copy the Mona Lisa. I'm like, oh, the uh, paint, uh, the, the tone is really nice or the real of the background or the technique or something. Yeah. You take something from it. There, there's there's a aspect of inevitability right now because it's brand new and there's excitement about the bottom line and the video game devs and the animation studios you know that these places are controlled by the executives by the numbers crunchers by the money people so it's a new way to do something quickly and cheaply and unfortunately the creatives aren't the ones calling the shots but it's got to swing a certain it looks like unfortunately it's got to swing now a certain amount in that direction in order to come back to being like, okay, now we see the value of, you know, that's just the, the, the nature of humanity. You know what I mean? It's, it's going to be a dark period. I mean, it's already really bad in animation right now. It's going to be, it's going to be bad for a while until some sort of reason is ushered in. No, it's over, Dig. I mean, it, it, it is over, you know, like you it really think it's is. over. Yeah. You think it's not going to see, I always think, I don't mean to, kind of it's not one for one but i always think of the ebook thing i think i talk about this a lot i remember when you know in the early 2000s like the early to mid aughts when ebooks were ushered ushered in and barnes and nobles and borders bookstores were closing and it was like all right i guess no one's gonna read books and magazines anymore like we really thought that for a while and then it was like people returned to like no we love the tactile mm-hmm. sensation of having books and having our shelves filled with actual books you know if it's going to be that sort of thing where there's going to be room for everything, but maybe right. that's but too you, optimistic. I don't well, know. But what you're saying is, and we're not even on any of the topics yet, but what you're saying is. This could be a topic. This, yeah, yeah. this, this, <laughs> this could be a topic. A topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, what you're saying is that people would have to make a choice to know that the stuff is AI generated and refuse it. That's basically the equivalent of what you're saying about. Because I agree with you. I, I thought I wanted to read books digitally. And then I was like, I don't want to read books like this at all. And, right. and I still buy books to this day. So yeah, I can't I can't do like Kindle and stuff. It's just mm-hmm. something with my brain. But no there's this connection. idea that people aren't going to care. And it's really up to the audiences. It's like not even up to the creators. It's truly up to the audiences. I think very similar to there being organic food and boutique stores and all this kind of stuff. I think there will be products in the future where it's like no AI was used making this. No AI was involved in this in any way. That kind of that. stuff. Very yeah. similar to the Rage Against the Machine records where it would say like these albums were made without the use of turntables on the back or whatever. Because people thought that they were scratching when they were really playing on the guitar. Or right. Tom Morello specifically. And so it's up to the audience, but I don't think the audience is that discerning. And I don't, you know, generally, and I, not our audience, but just the audience. And I don't think I'm sad about it, but maybe this runs into my own topic. Maybe I'll just roll right in my topic first. I was going to go to Dagan first because he has to go, but I'll go to, I'll go first. Cause this makes we more sense. We'll go yeah. to Dagan. This is good. I want to talk about consumerism. Just generally how people feel about this. And maybe this is what speaks to it about more, about needing more, about buying more, about having more, about spending. Um, and maybe this actually feeds, this is almost unintentional. It's almost like I wrote it, but I didn't. I'm just <laughs> AI broken, broken clock. <laughs> yeah, the AI, I, put it, I plugged it into open AI and it told me to segue this way. I'm, I'm concerned about capitalism in a, and how, and I've said, I've talked about this a lot, but how it's been conflated from free markets to, you know, generally free markets domestically, of course, to this idea that you just need to have and buy and keeps up, keep up with the Joneses and constantly spend money, earn money to spend, need more things. And I've really in my life to varying levels of success, tried very hard to resist this urge. Um, 
And I'm just wondering where you, and, and, and it's funny because the AI conversation feeds into it where the only, you guys will appreciate this. You're all, all play games is there. And Jaffe and I have spoken about this, where there's this idea. It's like, well, we can get games done. We can get, do more games more quickly. And I'm like, who wants more games? Who wants more games? How many fucking games do you want to come out at one time? I can't keep up with them at all. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of games come out a year. Thousands. And Dagan and I just did a top. What we try to do top 10 NES lists. To, we kind of failed. But the idea is that Dagan and I, there's almost no NES game you can name that I don't know. Seriously. Like you, you can actually know it all. Not having necessarily played it all, but I've played most of it. Mm, sure. most, a lot of them via emulators, of course. But that's fucking nuts. That's like knowledge of a product so deep. N64 is an even deeper product. That you, can, you can easily know all that stuff. What is it, 300 or 400 games or something on it? Yeah. I'm not saying you want that few games. I had an N64 contemporary to when it was out, and it was the most boring machine in the world. You had to wait like <laughs> six months in between worthwhile <laughs> games. And, and, I, and I, think yeah. I, owned, I think I owned every... I think I own Dagan can tell me because he has my collection, but I'm pretty sure I own like every consequential game on the N64. Like anything you would even remotely think was consequential because it was so easy to keep up with it. I don't necessarily want that either. But this need for more, more choice, more things. You go to the supermarket and it's just it used to be like the Soviet versus versus Western capitalist markets of like, look at the supermarket here and then look at the fucking sad Soviet supermarket stuff. But I don't want I don't want that. I'm not saying that. I'm just so worried about everything going amok and being more driving more, more profit, more churn. Oh, it, it grosses me out. And something that I love so deeply, like capitalism has been corrupted so deeply that we want to buy cheap plastic from China desperately, <laughs> desperately. We want it. I just don't get it. Dig. Yeah. Well, Matty, did you want to jump in first? I'm oh, sorry. No, no, no. I was agreeing with you. Sorry, okay. no. let, let Dig go. Yeah. Okay, yeah, Dig. I, I want to hear from you first. Mm. What, what do you think about this? I mean, it's, it's yeah. just a general topic of consumerism, corrupted capitalism. Do you feel like you're a consumerist? Do you? Um, there used to be a, a wonderful website. I don't know if you guys remember it called The Consumerist. I used to love it. It was it was and ended up being purchased by Consumer Reports, actually, and then it was shut down later. But it was super awesome because it was just about all the fucked up things businesses did, basically. And they would just publish. It's actually one of the very few jobs I kind of looked at going and doing when I was at IGN that was outside of the industry where they had a, they had an opening and I was like, hmm, glad <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> but I was really poor. Um, so, Dig, what do you, where are you? On, what, what, where did your mind go with this, this, this long winding topic? I think it's a topic that people are less and less surprised to hear from me because I think there's this idea that I'm like strongly like free market capitalism and run amok, but I'm really not and um, never really have been. So this is touching me more and more deeply as we go on. Yeah, man. I mean, I like what you're saying where it's basically corrupted capitalism. You know what I mean? That this consumerism crosses over into something that could be negative. It's funny that you say this though, because I'm such, I realized for myself, like I'm a huge hypocrite when it comes to this, because I was literally saying to Helene, like last week, I was saying, and not to put Colin on the spot or blow him up. I was like, if I had Colin's money, I would be the guy with the M3 in the driveway <laughs> and I'd have the Breitling watch. Like I would, I would be at the country club. Like I, there's definitely that thing. And I don't know if it's growing up on Long Island where it was that whole keeping up with the Joneses mentality, but I like things like, honestly, I don't mean to sound vapid, but I like stuff. You know what I mean? So I would have like, I might have the $25,000 watch. You know what I mean? If I had, it's actually good that I make a more reasonable amount of money because I think it would be bad for me. And then you kind of feel bad about yourself because then you realize, well, it's kind of about status, about it's about other people's perception, but it's also the world we grew up in, right? Like I can remember being a kid, it was always something, right? It was like, you had to get the Furby, you had to get the Cabbage Patch Kid, you had to get the Tickle Me Elmo, everybody needed a Wii. And you couldn't get one, the scarcity, right? Nobody cared about video games. Two thirds of the people that cared, you know, that needed a Wii didn't care about video games. They just needed a Wii because everybody needed a Wii, you know, that type of thing. You know where it, it, it dawns on me though, where it gets an aggravating? And again, I think this is complete hypocrisy on my part. When that Stanley Cup thing started to become this viral thing, I was like, this, everybody needs this specific drinking cup. 
Like people, because I could understand wanting things you're passionate about, right? Like you're passionate about cars. You need to have a BMW. I get it. But we're passionate about drinking cups. Then it just becomes like bling for the sake of bling. Like I have to rock the Supreme sweatshirt because that's what everybody has. I have to rock the Lululemon, whatever the fuck it is. You know what I mean? Like just those people that have to be on, you know, they have to be kind of flaunting it in every aspect. That's where it gets aggravating for me. It's like, and maybe again, maybe this is hypocrisy, but I'm like, choose a lane. Like what's important to you? You, you like to have, you need a fresh pair of Jordans. You're a sneakerhead. Okay, do that. Cars do that. But like when it becomes everything and it becomes, it, it almost, you know what bothers me about it? It's not that I want to tell people how to spend their money, their hard earned money. They have their druthers, right? This is a free world that we're in. But it's that it just looks it, it it just looks bad. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't show out very positively for you when you just are obviously 100% flash across the board, if that makes sense. So it's like, I just have to have the best of everything and make sure everybody knows it type of thing. But then, you know, on the other hand, I'm no better than that. You know, I definitely get caught up in that. I'm somewhere, I'm somewhere in between someone who's like ruthlessly aware of that and someone who completely goes in for it. You know what I mean? Like I show a lot of humanity in that because I'm not immune to that. Like I want to have a nice, I want to have nice stuff. I want people to know I'm doing well. You know what <laughs> I mean? I want to, I want to kind of signal success and all that kind of thing, whatever we're doing with that kind of thing. But, and you know what, the other thing is, uh, it occurs to me like that sort of thing, that's, uh, that's probably always going to be a thing in our culture. Right. Like I'm, I'm talking about growing up with it and that when we were little, it was the toys and we got older, it was the clothes. And then we got older, it was the cars and then the square footage of your house, whatever it is, you know, your video game collection, whatever it is, right. Your comic book collection, whatever you, whatever you, you know, what you're speaking to membership. It's funny, Dave, what you're speaking to is, do you guys know the, have you ever heard of the book called the millionaire next door from the late nineties? So a really seminal book. Um, it was written by Thomas Stanley, Thomas Stanley. And, um, it's basically about it was it's an inspiration for me in some way. I've never read it. It's just always cited and people always pull things out of it and share it. And because I'm really in the just finance and just reading about this stuff or whatever. And they had this idea that there's something called a prodigious accumulator of wealth. And they compare them to the under accumulator of wealth. And what they found basically the the, the synopsis of this of the book as far as i understand is that they basically went to study where rich people live or where people with money live and what they found was that most m- people with money live in middle class neighborhoods mm-hmm. um and that many people which we, they would call under accumulators of wealth are often people like you're describing dagan where it's like i'm a doctor i make half a million dollars a year i drive all the nicest stuff i have a net worth of only two million dollars now I'm not saying that that's not a lot of money, but if you're making half a million dollars a year and your net worth when you're 50 or 60 is 2 million, you have, you have frittered away everything. Like you have nothing compared to what you should have. And they made the argument basically that people that are good at saving money, and this is kind of an under reduction, I guess of it, but it's, it was very inspirational for me. It's like, just save your money. Don't spend it. Don't, don't spend more than you need. Don't, you know, and accumulate that money and you'll, f- and so basically they found that the most wealthy people live in like even blue collar neighborhoods, nonetheless, middle-class neighborhoods because it makes sense because people that care the most to accumulate wealth, the av- as opposed to the average accumulator of wealth, you want to be the prodigious accumulator of wealth in their theory or whatever. The people that want to be prodigious accumulators of wealth know that it's not a good idea to have a huge house necessarily to like heat it forever and to like do all these different things, pay right. exorbitant property tax. It's much better to just live in your 3000 square foot house in a modest middle class neighborhood and chill. Yeah, because that's the premise of the, that's the premise of the millionaire next door. So like I always I always imbibed that in some sense. That idea. So, and by the way, it's not about having a lot of money. It's about a lifestyle. I, I, I learned about that when I was making forty thousand dollars a year. And the idea was like, if you do certain things, you are, you live within this realm, realm of being an accumulator of wealth. Yeah. Um, even if you just make a little bit of money, it should be, it's something like 10% of your net worth should be the amount of money you've made or something like that. So whatever that is comparable. So I, and not to be nerdy about it, but that's what it reminded me of was the, the millionaire next door, which I highly mm. recommend mm. people check out instead of reading it through a bunch of articles, you can just read it, actually read it if you want. It's smart, man, because if you, this is the philosophy you have to embody. And I'm not very good at this. I need to get better at this. Is if you could just kind of embody that philosophy of enjoying 
what you make, you know, making money, spending it, treating yourself, you know, not depriving yourself, taking care of your family, all of that. And balance that with saving and being wise with your money, right? Not squandering it, that sort of thing. If you could kind of find that balance in there, because there's also the thing of you can't take it with you, right? Mm, Which is kind of something mm. I gently nudge Colin with from time to time, you know, from time to time where I'm like, go on a vacation, spend a little, like enjoy what you're, you enjoy your success, that type of thing. So if you could kind of find that balance again, and you have the means to find that balance. So there's, you know, not everybody's in that position, but that's, that would be the key to me. Don't you think, I don't know, man, like I'm proud that as I've done better in my life, I've remained the same kind of the same. I think I'm much more comfortable than I was when I was younger, but I'm still like just dressing and fucking I look like I'm homeless half the time. I don't care. I literally I cut my own hair. My beard looks like shit half the time. I don't know. I just don't. There's a humanism to it. When, yeah, yeah. Like it's like I don't want to be consumed by things and the the money is nice, but I it, they, you're right. David, it just sits sits there, you know, but it's like. Mm-hmm. You know what? And I, but I think that's the way, way that's always been the way it was for me. I remember an ex a long time ago, exes ago, asked me, she's because I, I used to be, I used to really love saving and not spending or whatever. And she was like, when is it going to be enough? And mm. I'm like, never, it's never going to be enough, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> and, I, and, and she now she was a forensic psychologist. And so she would get into it about like she worked at San Quentin, actually, and she would get into it. She's like, dude, this is like totally from your childhood. like. You know, like, which is why I'm so focused on it. She's like, it's totally from your parents getting divorced and like you not having any stability. That's exactly what it is. And I'm like, sure. thanks. We can't be w- with each other anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Um, let's, hold on. Yeah, I thought it was yeah, funny that you brought up yeah, uh, clothes you wear and stuff like that. A lot of the richest people, they don't wear really nice clothes, I would say, or anything that stands out. You look at Steve Jobs, he just wears a fucking turtleneck and like some Levi's. Great example. You look at a lot of these execs and they're, all of them are just wearing slacks and like vests that you zip up and stuff. They all look the same. They're not like really high fashion, expensive clothes that you think about. So I do agree with you. A lot of the richest people, you wouldn't really tell just by looking at them. Maybe their car, maybe their house. But if you just look at the human individually, I think they just look like normal people. And that's right. That's the premise, of, wealth. the premise of the millionaire next door. Thomas yeah. Stanley, shout out. Don't know if yeah. he's still alive anymore. Um, um, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say too, also about the capitalism thing. It, it's interesting because it's human nature for greed in a lot of ways, and it's something humanity struggles over throughout history and will continue to struggle without. So, the idea of capitalism, I do like a lot. Like free market, that's all really great. But yes, people do take it too far, and it's sad, man, because you see a lot of these people that have insane wealth, insane wealth, like multi generational wealth, and just fucking kick people to the curb for percentage or something like that. It's, it sucks, man. And I understand it, but it bums me out, man. It's like everything good is a double-edged sword pretty much in this world. Mm-hmm. And there's good to come from it. And there's always going to be bad to come from it. Yeah, I, I personally, this is this is very not right wing. And that's why I, I think I'm a little more amorphous politically than people might think. But I personally don't think the system should allow the accumulation of a certain amount of wealth. Sure, I understand. Like, I, I, I don't I, think that's I, a bad I, idea. Like I, we have people that are so rich yeah. there are a few hundred people literally a few hundred people in the united states that have more money than the bottom 50 percent, and that's <laughs> that's nuts that's um not acceptable now it's not their fault it's the system the mm-hmm. system should simply not allow this and people ask like well how could that be and it's like well you probably have to have a really onerous taxation at a certain level i mean that's <laughs> that's how it would happen and people would say like oh then it would bounce people out of commerce and from doing great things and i'm like i just doubt that there's always people wanting to climb. In fact, I think these people occupy spaces because they have money, but not talent. Maddie, yeah. where do you, uh, where yeah. are you on this? I have many of thoughts. I was writing notes as you guys were talking. Um, <clears throat> I guess starting at the root of it, it's like, oh, how did we get here? Right. And I think we, obviously we live in a very like instant gratification driven society, right? Like you think of Instagram reels, TikTok culture. It's just like, you know, next, next, next. Right. I think of Amazon, speedy deliveries, right? Like just I have fallen prey to that so many times. How couldn't you? Like there were just moments I'm like, why wouldn't I? It's cheaper here. 
it's quicker here. Why wouldn't I? And that convenience, I think, can chew us up. And then there are moments that I think we're a little more, I'd say, ignorant to it. I think the food industry is something maybe some people are are waking up to. But you look at dairy and meat, and uh, I don't I don't mean to sound like PETA out here. I'm just saying, like, when you look at like, for example, how the cows are treated and and how they're killed and how that leaks into the food and the milk you drink and shit, like it's disgusting. Um, and that is driven by a level of consumerism. Like we need more, we need to produce more because the shelves are emptying and we need to fill them ASAP. So who gives a fuck about quality of life, kill them and let's get these shelves full. Like there's that kind of aspect to it. Um, gaming, you brought up gaming earlier, Colin, you know, I, I always see people saying they're buying games physically that are just sealed on their shelves still. And I, I have maybe two of those moments, but I'm like, I don't get it. Like, why are we buying stuff we're not going to use? You know, uh, buying stuff you won't unseal, subscribing to Game Pass when there's a million things coming out, you have a huge backlog. Like, why are you doing this? And it's just, we live in this society where I feel you constantly need that gratification just because everything drives into that same lane. AI, we talked about, right? Like speeding up things that take a long time pr- to produce. We used to be because I think the way technology was, you had to be a patient society. But because as technology has advanced, you can you ha- you can afford to be less patient because you can just. It, it was think about like twenty years ago. It was an insane concept to say I can order something today and it'll be here on my doorstep tomorrow, right? And as we're seeing like Amazon evolve, like they're shuttling shit out. You'll be able to eventually put an order in. And you'll see a drone just come from a warehouse nearby, leave it on your step, maybe two hours from that order. Like it's going to get to that point. And that's the thing is there's always room to keep going forward. And I think with the money that's driving it, it's not going to stop. And what does maybe slow it are personalities, right? So Mm -hmm. Colin, you're a good example. For me, like I'm not rich by any stretch. But when I came into money, when I first started doing like Fallout 4 videos and like, I was a college kid. I was living at home. So I was lucky to be able to like pocket the money I was making. But I didn't like when I got uh, one one of my probably my most viewed video ever was uh, my impressions on Fallout 76 at a preview event. I think it did like three million, which I've never seen that before. Um, And I'm pretty sure that that's 15 percent of the traffic this channel has done. I think (laughs) which is crazy, right? It it, it speaks to the, the morbid curiosity that that 76 drove um and so when when you look at that and obviously with like viewership that generates revenue i came into like that month when the youtube page i came in like more than i've seen in a while and i was like holy shit and what did i do with it like i i tried to go the elegant route like i was like all right you know what like i can have a fuck it purchase can i like why not so dragon ball was doing like a limited adidas line of shoes it's like 300 bucks I try. I bought them. It's so funny because I I'm scared to wear them because I spent so much on them. Yeah. <laughs> I only wear it when like the ground's completely dry. But I tried it and something felt wrong. I was just like, "Well, this isn't me." I was like, "That didn't feel good or right." And what started to feel right is when I, whenever I come into money, I don't really pocket it per se for my personal wealth. Do I like build up my own personal savings? Mm-hmm. Of course. Like I. You know, we're, we don't have the benefit of like when we retire from YouTube, it's like, oh, someone's going to take care of me. It's like, <laughs> I have to be ready for that. Like, I have to do my part to be ready for that uh, in a number of ways, not just personal savings. But like I chose when I came into money, it's like, I don't want to save this for myself. I want to. Yeah, I can't employ anyone full time, but I want to give other people money. Like I want to I want to try to do things with this. So like here I am doing retro rebound. And like now we have an illustrator doing our thumbnails. Obviously, I pay a lot more for the edits like. You know, we're we're working on something else that I'll announce in a couple of months, and then, um, you know, we're working on a game. And like, I, Laley and I were funny. I'm just talking about it last night because I was pretty stressed heading into today. I was like, "Damn, I got a fucking stack day." And she's like, "Have you ever thought of just like doing less?" And I'm like, "If I did less, I'd probably lose my mind just because I like to create things." And I think that's the stopping force of consumerism to a degree is. I, I, and it may be naive, and I just believe there's always going to be people who want to buck the trend or do things in a traditionalist fashion. Like, 
I, you it's funny you mentioned like there will be products that say like made without ai and it's like i definitely think gaming is going to be the first place you see that sort of like stake in the ground made like yeah we made this game and and no fucking ai helped us like every step of the way it was just people working on it and we made this not a computer um and like that i, I was already saying that uh on defining duke like i could see that being my own game development companies like personal not branding but like one of the mantras we live by like ai free like you know we don't use ai we you know we try to make games within reason of our team size but um i think that's the stopping force is personalities and and i don't know if in mass that'll happen but i do think the businesses themselves will diversify to adjust to an ai controlled society where like some people don't want to be involved in that actually a kind of telling story of all games is fallout 4 which i know people don't go to for like thought provoking writing maybe but i think the way they write the synths versus the humans and that lack of ability to tell who's real and who's quote fake um is kind of where we're at with ai we're having these moments like again i'll go to gaming we're having these moments where it's like oh if someone didn't tell me that was ai i wouldn't have known any better um, you could kind of hear it with the finals and like the announcers, but I think there are people who are none the wiser. And what's what's happening is that is going to gradually intrude our lives more and more. And everyone's going to have that sort of come to Jesus moment of like, all right, I really like that. And it wasn't until after I completed it that I learned that was from AI. And you either have this moment of that took something away from the experience or if I let that take away from the experience, it's ruined something I otherwise truthfully did enjoy. And so I feel like a lot of people are going to have that, you know, face yourself moment. Um, and, and that's where the personality develops. Like some people will be like, I didn't like that. Like, I don't like that. That was not from a human that that felt heart that should that was heartfelt. Like that should have been from a person, not a computer who had like a prompt put in. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's driven by instant gratification ultimately. But uh, it's a lot of thoughts on it just because I, it's, it's a, a topic that I. I think I talk about a lot, but I, I never put it under like the label of consumerism. It's just I I feel society tries to move way quicker than it really needs to. Mm -hmm. uh, think of news, mm -hmm. social media, the way we're just so tapped in. Uh, you know, you're just there was a time. I mean, I've started to live this way. I don't know if others have, but there was a time, man, where it was just like you had to be plugged in. Just what's going on? What's the next tweet? What's the next news story breaking like it drives businesses in some cases like i'm sure there are people at ign who fucking grind twitter because the latest scoop just hit the latest the, the, the latest leak just hit i'm like that's your next story and that's your next bit of traffic like it's all now 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 and you like many businesses i'm sure would operate differently if they could afford to so the people who can afford to operate differently should and kind of control destiny a bit more but yeah it's a great topic man because um i think many of us are in agreement that you know we we move a little too fast and we're always a little too in demand but i think it's up to the people to really decide if you know we're going to keep in that direction and it seems like we are so it's kind of tough yeah yeah did, did yeah. anyone else want, yeah go ahead yeah go ahead. i just was going to say when we're talking about like ai and consumerism i th just think that stuff's going to get more intrusive as people get or younger generations start growing up because they're just not going to care about any of that stuff like we do. Hmm? That's just going to be normal to them. Think about, mm. I remember when people, you know, cell phones came out, people were worried about staring at your phone too long and all that stuff. Now everyone's doing that. Even like my mom who would complain about us, you know, our phones is now on her phone all the time. And kids are just growing up more and more with stuff like that. So it's not going to be a big deal to them. Something else might come out in the future that will scare them, but for now, it's just it's going to keep going that way. But I think Maddie was right just at the speed that we get there and when they push in, how we will get there eventually. The lack of concern about or it, it's everyone's kind of like nonplussed about all of our use of devices like as it's it's a very new thing. If you went back 20, 30 years ago, people be like, what the fuck is wrong? Like, what is going on? You're all possessed. There <laughs> yep. isn't that isn't wasn't there that parable about how there's there's like an idea that if aliens came to invade that they would think that our phones had power. Like the, if they were just observing us, they would think mm -hmm. like there's something about these devices. Like are they, are the devices in charge? I love that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I'll say just on the, on the 
topic of consumerism, like there are all these fake political problems that don't really matter mm-hmm. that are used to distract from this really major problem that one way or another is going to be resolved and people, it might get bad the more it gets, which is just wealth inequality. And I love the idea of what you're saying about Maddie, about people being better as individuals. And I've tried to live like that as best I can. And I know a lot of other people do, but this, this striving for endless growth, the, there has to be a consumer on the other end. There has to be someone being prodded and poked to waste and spend. And, and it's not to say everything is not needed, but many things aren't. And we all fall into these traps, but I am, I am truly concerned about wealth inequality. And I think that that amongst all the other distractions, whether it's like Ukraine or, um, and some of these things are real and important too, like the border and all these kinds of things. Really the fundamental problem is who has money and who doesn't and how much money the people that have money have and how little the people that don't have money have. And this gets solved one way or the other. And it's not to be like dire and say like, there's gonna be a fucking French revolution style thing, but like you're kind of begging for that over time if you let mm-hmm. it get bad enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, I don't know how anyone could, and, and the disproportion in, in wealth is frankly more pronounced now than it was during the French Revolution. So it's just that it's the bread and circuses kind of late Rome distraction thing where you don't really know what's going on around you unless you really focus in on it and we're all distracted. But I think it's really terrible that people have so little. And it's not to say that everyone should be rich or have lots of money. It's just to say there needs to be a better eye placed on the have nots. And mm-hmm. not even globally, but just domestically. Globally, that's not really our problem. But I'm I'm really talking about like domestically, even like we have an underclass in the United States, like truly. And you hear really dark shit about immigration, for instance, where it's like, oh, who's gonna fucking pick our fruit? Who's gonna clean our houses? It's like, are you crazy? Are you guys? N-? I saw this thing about how this woman in Massachusetts now they're letting like migrants live with them, and this woman was earnestly saying like, oh, I let this you know this Haitian family live with us, and they cook for us, and they clean for us, and I'm like, so, and people are like, so you have slaves. Like basically, and I'm not saying just because of the color of the skin. It's like, this is how insane this all breaks down when really everyone just needs to be treated to a certain level well and economically fairly to be be given similar opportunities, not outcomes, but just opportunities. And I think this is all going to fall apart really soon. I just don't, you know, there's a, a disconnect when you see on the news, look how great the economy is. And then everyone thinks the economy is bad. It's like mm-hmm. there's just a total like like go to the grocery store, dude. Um, I don't know. I think it's terrible. So that's what I'm I'm most sad about these days is is that the consumerism is built on the back of these people, backs of these people. And I don't I, I hope there's so much it's so much different than ha- you know, having millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars and then having a billion dollars, two billion dollars, three billion, mm-hmm. four. This is unthinkable amounts of money, in my opinion. For, for one person to have yeah. and more power to them. A lot of them earned it, made smart bets, made great investments. But to me, I'd be like, well, I don't even know what you do with that much money except for to give it away. Yeah, and, I and, agree. And it's like, I'll keep a um, hundred million for myself and then and I'll be just fine and then give the rest to, to I don't know, to charity. Anyway, this is getting off base. I just wanted to touch on that. It's a bummer. It's it's interesting to, to hear your stuff, too, about kind of admitting that you would fall into that, because I think I would I oh, would, too, in some time. sense. I must admit when I this is a kind of an, a weird example, but Mike and I love Antiques Roadshow. I've always loved it. I've gotten Mike in it in the last few years and there's stuff on there regularly, like where I'm like, I would buy that, like th- where I <laughs> like where I'm like, I can't imagine I can't imagine how you can have this. I use always the example of George Washington's hair, like a lock of George Washington's hair is like $10,000 or whatever. Mike is laughing in the background, but it's like, dude, that's kind of insane. But there was, we were watching it a few days ago. We were watching, there's like um, a letter Lincoln wrote to someone and it's like, oh, it's 2000 or $3,000. I'm like, that's it? Like <laughs> to have a letter like that? So to that's me, I cool. almost fall into it in like some weird way where like if I had access to the people on Antiques Roadshow, I probably would have bought seven or eight of their things over the last See season. That? Everybody has a thing. Yeah. Yep. Everybody has something that, you know, just don't, that's the thing that I was saying, like that I think, and again, this is really judgmental on my part, but when, when your thing is everything, like when you need the Stanley, like I know you're not passionate about water cups. Why do you need the Stanley cup? You know, it's like, you don't need it. 
the Stanley people Cup killing so, each other for Stanley Cups. The like Stanley it's Cup insane. thing is so funny. Not only it's that it's hilarious. not only that it's the Stanley Cup, but that there's already a Stanley Cup, which is the the trophy in the NHL. Yep. And so That's every time so I hear confusing. it, I'm like, so there's another thing called the Stanley Cup, and now people are earnestly saying that like it's not the Stanley Cup. Yeah, like, what I had to get through you? that. Yeah, I had to get through. Is it the Home Depot Stanley, like the one that makes tape measures? <laughs> I had to get through that. I was like, what is this thing? What? And then now, kill people are killing each other. In like the uh, what what do you call it like the the breezeway of Walmart like literally tackling each other for water it's like what the fuck you know but I'm the but I would I would love a BMW in the driveway so am I any different no it's to complete say, it's a cup you know you're not beating people up about a cup <laughs> it's a cup. it's a yeah. it's like a plastic cup it's wild they were told that's the thing that's the sought after yeah. thing that's the thing I gotta have. You know, I remember with the Stanley Cup, there was a a video of someone like whose car, I guess, like exploded or set on fire. And the only thing they pulled out of it that survived, it was totally fine, was the Stanley Cup. And they were like, this is unbelievable. And then I think the CEO of the company or something like that uh, said, like, he was clearly trying to walk the legal line so no one else could like blow their cars up and like <laughs> and get like free shit. But I think he offered her money. He's like, this one time free offer. We're going to give you X amount of dollars to, I think, get your, uh, to get your car back and something like that but uh yeah that's like my core memory with with stanley cups and since then i just hear about it all the time I'm like this is a thing like it's a fucking cup guys mm-hmm. stanley cup get, get yourself life. a one gallon jug and call it a day you'll have enough water to last you all day you don't gotta think about it it's just right there stupid cups all right good chat dave i know we have to let you go soon so let's go to you next yeah man i want to do this one um can i just say this goes back to something brad said in the intro but you know what makes me really sad when people cook for themselves, but go like all out, like let's say Brad, t- now, now maybe this is just me. You guys tell me, okay, let's say Brad made it. It's just him, right? He's uh, hanging out, makes the waffles, pulls out the waffle maker, makes them all legit. He's sauteing things in the pan. He's got a pan <laughs> in each hand. He's making like this really complicated meal and then plates it really beautifully just for himself and then just sits down by himself and eats. That makes me so sad. The thought <laughs> of that makes me so upset. Since Brad mentioned the waffle thing, and of course, he's got Trader Joe's instant waffles. He didn't say this. This is where my mind went. I've been so sad since he said that, thinking about someone fixing like this really complicated meal just for themselves. No one's going to see it. It's just them. <laughs> No one's going to, it's going to be all beautifully plated that they sit down with a knife and fork, tucking the napkin and eat it. It's like Alucard in Castlevania season two. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know why that makes me so sad. It just does. I don't know what it is. All right. That's not my topic though. Guys, I pitched to you, bring me a strange sort of mind blowing fact, something that shocked you. Maybe it's something you already knew about. Maybe it's something you found out about recently. Sort of a fact that most people probably wouldn't know. Not a personal thing, like a worldly fact. A fun yeah. fact, if you will. And I'll tell you, before I pass the baton on to the next guy, I'll tell you what made me think of this. I had three sort of random, strange facts hit me in one day. And I was like, oh my, it just got me on this train of thought of like, my God, how many crazy facts are out there that would floor me? You know, so I'll tell you what started it. I go for a walk every day. It's about four or five miles. I, I really enjoy walking. During my walk, I had these random thoughts and I was like, I wonder what's the furthest that you could walk on earth in a straight line without being interrupted by a body of water. So no ocean, no lake to um, put up an obstacle. Just how long could you walk straight linearly on the earth? And now I'm thinking like I'm American, so I'm thinking North America. Maybe it's like the top west of uh, you know Alaska, and then you go down in a diagonal to Miami or something. But I researched it, and apparently you could do a walk from Magadan, Russia, down to Cape Town, South Africa, mm-hmm. straight. Mm-hmm. Maybe an occasional bridge. So the east coast of Russia. 14,000 miles. Yeah. Wow. Which is, I was like, whoa, that's insane. That's pretty crazy. I never knew that. Then later on that day, just kind of in a random fashion, I found out one of those things that you never think about, but probably should have known had you tried to wrap your head around it, that at least 9 million people on earth 
share your birthday, no matter what day it is. No matter which of the 365 wow. days you're sharing that birthday with at least a minimum of 9 million people. Isn't there something, Dig, about that? Like, isn't there like a mathematical principle that indicates that birthdays aren't equally separated? Do you know what I'm talking about? No, where, there's a day that's the most popular. Right. Like, there, like y- you would think that it would be equally separate, but there's, there's a, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There's something, there's like a, like a principle about that. I can't remember what it is. That's so of interesting. Why is that, that day? Yeah. Or, or about like, about the distribution of days like that and birthdays and all of that kind of stuff about how, Everything circulates around certain days. Oh, I days. know. It is. I just found this out recently. Yeah. I, don't, I think the date is, do the math, I don't know, September 4th or something. Mo, uh, the majority of people are born on this day because the most people make love on New Year's Eve. Hmm. So the most people are born subsequently, whatever that is, exactly nine months-ish later. I think that's what it was. And I, th- I want to say the date was September 4th, but don't quote me on that. And that was the whole thing. The, like there was a reason for it. Most people have sex that day. So <laughs> most people, you know, so I don't know. Getting it in. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that so much. I really do. So my mind was already kind of, this was already almost too much. And then I found out this last fact, which I don't know why this one was just, this one just blew my mind. And I think it speaks to the fact of when I went to high school in the nineties, and I remember, I've talked about this with Colin before on one of the shows, sitting down with my guidance counselor and it was like, I was a junior and it was like career day and it was sitting down like, all right, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to be an animator. And no one knew what that was. This was like 91, 92, right? It was like, okay, so she had her big, it looked like a Bible or like a Webster's dictionary. She had this big book physical book of careers. And she's like, all right, so graphic designer, like that's as close as she could get to animator in this giant book in the nineties. Then I found out there's a college up in Toronto, Canada called Humber college, right? Up in Ontario where you could major and receive a degree in comedy writing and comedy performance. And I was like, oh my God, is it this it's 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 dialed in this like you could minor in something so specific now, which blew my mind. And then I think in looking casually, other schools do offer comedy writing majors, or at least you could minor. Let's say you go to Iowa State for writing, you could minor in comedy writing. So it is a thing. But I think this school specifically up in Toronto, you could get a degree in specifically comedy writing and or comedy performance. And I was just, my mind was blown by that, that you could go in and get a, a degree that specific now. It blows my mind to think that you can teach people to be funny. Yeah. Like how do you, <laughs> what's the bar for entry there? Like you should have to, ha- there should be some kind of portfolio requirement, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To at least have minimum skills to be, you know, but it's, you know, it's not though, because it's a college, it's a money-making institution. So, you know, they're just letting these people, mm-hmm. these really dull- <laughs> People that don't have a shot. <laughs> I didn't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing to be that, to have, to offer young people something that specific. That's what I can't really wrap my head around. But just the fact that you could be that, you know what I mean? If, if, you're, if you're of the mind to have that much direction as a 19-year-old, maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. All right, Brad, I'm passing this on to you, my All friend. Right. Give me a strange mind-blowing fact. Could be anything. Okay. Take it away. So mine's about the ocean. The ocean, uh, a mysterious place. Terrifying, in my opinion. Mm. Eldritch horrors down there and all that shit. (laughs) The ocean makes up about 70% of our Earth. How it covers it, which is just crazy. And I recently learned that we as humans who have been exploring throughout our entire time on this planet have only explored about 5% of the entire ocean <laughs> when it's 70, yeah, we're about, about 70% of our, pl- <laughs> our whole planet. Well, that's, that's where the aliens planet. are hiding. Down <laughs> yeah. in the ocean, yeah. Sure. I okay, just couldn't sense, believe yeah. it. You know, when I think of like people like psychopaths like James Cameron going underwater and shit and their little submarines and all this stuff going on that we've still seen so little of this earth. Yeah. Like what is down there, man? Are there's are there gonna be aliens down there, like some bloodborne monster ready to kill <laughs> us or anything like that? It's just crazy to me. 
Anything could be lurking down there. And you know what? Granted, every time we try, it doesn't go very well, as we saw mm-hmm. last year, right? Yeah, it, yeah. That guy met literal oblivion. If you see the animations of what they think happened to it. Oh, it's the, like we're uh, going uh, Titan craft. We're going to other like planets, essentially, or like to the moon out in space. And we can't even go that far into the ocean yet. It's just crazy to me, man. Like if you even just go that far, you will just die. You the pressure will just kill you. It's insane to me. It's like in a game when you fall off a cliff and eventually you hit that part where it kills you. Yeah, like that's, that's that's going deep underwater. Like you just hit this barrier, and just it triggers. It's like you're dead now. Yeah, that's yeah. a good, that's a good reference. Throwing. Yeah, it's um, Graham Hancock makes the point too about the ocean that the the ocean obviously ebbs and flows such that so much land that was once lived on by it human civilization is under the water and even Mm -hmm. that stuff is is vastly under you know unexplored which is so fascinating to me i agree man it's because there's only you can't do these global surveys of it you know um, yeah from space or whatever i sometimes wonder how much we know about the ocean and how much is hidden in it that's that's where the whole idea of rapture came from remember it was like how the fuck would you get away with this it's like it's in the middle of the ocean like no who's gonna know it's here Mm -hmm. like how are you gonna know um not that rapture is real i wish it was that'd be cool that you know of yeah. you don't know <laughs> you wouldn't know no i that's true i wouldn't know that's true i, I would never they would never invite me to rapture i would yeah. never have been invited um maddie where are you on this so i guess mine's a little more uplifting in tmi but i thought it'd be funny anyway so yeah i was i was dropping a deuce right you know stand up you see your business and you're like oh this corn i'm like it's like how the fuck does this happen man i was like Seriously, like someone make it make sense. I was like, why is this the only food I see when it goes through me? So I looked it up. I found a couple things out here. I'll read one here. And then I found another interesting fact attached to it. Now, I, I know, Dagan, you were asking for mind blowing facts. <laughs> At least that's how you pitched it to Brad. Yeah. I don't know if this is mind blowing, but okay. I found it interesting nonetheless. So the explanation for the widely observed corn kernel and poop phenomenon is pretty simple. Mm. The, uh, the outside of the kernel of corn is made of cellulose, that indigestible plant fiber. We can digest the inside of the kernel, but the whole makes it through us unscathed, which I found interesting. So everything's digested, but the, the shell, right? The husk of the, of the corn remains. I say this is also true for a lot of other parts of plants, like kale stems, but corn's bright yellow mm. color stands out, making it easy. That's now, interesting. Kale stems. I've noticed that. Yeah. It's right? like the same. And they say there's a benefit to this phenomenon that if you're interested in tracking how long it takes food to go through your body, whether to gauge healthy or digestive system or just to satisfy curiosity, you use corn as a tracker. And I'm like, I wonder if that's a thing. And so I look it up and there are these like hospitals like how to manage your child's bowel habits. They're like, give them corn. And I'm like, this is like a tracer food, man. Mm -hmm. Like just to see how -hmm. long does it take to pass things through? So next time I have corn, I'm going to be I'm going to be seeing like, okay, I had it here at like 8 p.m. at night. on on like a Thursday. Let's see when it comes through, right? And I get to see in real time how fast things move through. You were amped, huh? Yeah, I was a little amped. I'm not going to lie. I was like, okay, (laughs) next time I have corn, I'm going to track this shit. Literally. (laughs) um, Yeah, I don't know. I just, I thought it was, it it was definitely, because I'm not much, like my fiance is like the fun fact queen. Mm. I had a close friend in hockey who was like a fun fact dude. Like just, you know, do a little bit about everything, right? Just like you bring up something. He's like, oh, yeah, there's someone from the 1800s who did X, Y, Z. I'm like, how do you find this shit out? So I'm not a good fun fact machine. That's definitely like one of my key flaws. Like I'm very in the now, perhaps too in the now. Um, so my historical knowledge when it comes to those sort of things is just not there. But I found this to be one of those random bits of curiosity where I went down the rabbit hole and I, I found out that the the corn you're passing, it is just the husk. The insides are gone. Mm. So. Hmm. There you go, Constellation crew. Interesting. I thought you were going to say, too, like that it had some sort of benefit. I don't know why my mind immediately went to like, does it act as like some sort of almost like, you know, if you imagine a kale stem or something like a Zamboni like thing along your gut as it's Cleaning. getting dragged out of you. <laughs> Cleaning yeah. up the, the bacteria and just scraping right. it all And up. it's like Jeez. scooping it out. Yeah. Um, so for me, I was thinking about this. I was originally going to talk about how the CIA declassified information about parallel universes and stuff. I don't know if you guys saw this, which is like so no, fucking no, weird. Like no, there's a CIA report about like earnestly about like interdimensional situations and shit like that, that people are reading right now. But instead I, I thought I would, we we did UAP stuff recently, so I didn't want to get into all of that again, but um, I was thinking about like world events and is there anything like relevant 
you know, Putin, the, the, the Putin did his interview with Tucker Carlson and the great memes that came out of that were so, it was very interesting. I was glad that he did it. Tucker personally like to hear, at least hear his side or hear what he thinks, but the whole like history lesson, like the whole meme oh, it was amazing. Of, like the memes are just amazing. He was he, holding court, man. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was. And it was he interesting. Really was. He's fascinating like to, 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 to see it. So I don't, I don't mind that at all. We should be talking to everyone, but I'm like, is there anything about Russia? We, you know, Putin kind of covered all that. So, you know, why, why don't we, uh, go and think about something else. And I was thinking, all right, well, there's nothing more third relish than Israel right now, but it's a, but it, it has nothing to do with what's going on there or even Israel itself. Have you ever, guys ever heard of the slattery report before by chance? No. no. What is that? I definitely heard it. This is a report from the late thirties under the FDR administration by the, the interior department about Alaska. So, and what they were going to do with it. So as you guys might know, in the in the years after, you know, Reconstruction, we buy um, Alaska and we don't really from Russia. Russia needs money because they're in a bunch of wars in mainland Europe. This is kind of the beginning of the end of the of the czarist reign, you know, like 40 years later, they'll be gone. So they're desperate to get to get money. They sell Russia, which was known or Alaska, which was known as Russian America. You, you can go read about it. Uh, they, they only had like 500, 1,000, 1,500 people there at any given time, but they were there for a long time. And uh, they sold it and they were out and we didn't really know what, what to do with it. And it's kind of funny to think about it because today it's like the, the Russians are probably so bummed that they sold it. And we are so amped because it has so much mineral wealth, not to mention, frankly, water, too, if it starts to melt up there or whatever. And we need it. But the mineral wealth, the oil, the gold, whatever you need, diamonds. Um, so there was this report from FDR where they were like, what, or two FDR from his interior department, where they're like, what do you want? What should we do with Alaska? They were kind of worried about it. Um, the war was not happening yet, but Japan had started the, the East Asian co-prosperity sphere. So they were expanding during the war. The Japanese do attack and occupy the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, which a lot of people don't talk about. Like we did have occupied American territory during the war and we had a fight to get those islands back. So they had kind of this expectation that Alaska would be under danger from foreign entities, specifically Japan and the Pacific, if they didn't start sending people there and like doing something with it more actively. And I thought this was interesting in relation to Israel, because we really the slattery report, what it suggests to FDR is to invite the um, Jewish people fleeing Europe. Now, this was even before it really popped off. With, hmm. with the Jews. Remember, the Nazis take over in January 33, and it's not really, and, and immediately they start fucking around with the Jews, but it's not really until 36, 37, 38, Crystal Knox in 38, where things really start going crazy. And then obviously the ghettos start getting built. People start getting sent to first, you know, holding camps and concentration camps that turn into death camps. So this idea came from the, from um, the interior department and it's Harry Slattery, who was the undersecretary of the interior uh, for FDR was like, well, we should invite the Jews to go to Alaska. And it's basically this hinge point in world history where it would have probably never worked the way that some Zionist angled people would have wanted it to. But the idea that instead of going to Israel, we could have actually had this, this exodus of Jewish people to Alaska. And basically the fear FDR refused to do it. And I'm sure you guys know, like, FDR, there's pretty deep anti-Semitism in the United States during this time and a lot of places in the world. There still is deep anti-Semitism in the United States, but they didn't want too many Jewish people. Mm. There's obviously the, the, the ships would come to the United States and be refused of like they would like send Jewish refugees back to Europe, literally be like, bye. And then they would land at some Nazi occupied port and be killed. Right. So this was the kind of thing that was happening. And I just, I find it so fascinating that in another universe, like another timeline, we could have relocated potentially millions of Jews to Alaska and others as well. They wanted just like, they wanted, they basically wanted to import people from all over the world to go to Alaska because no one, no Americans wanted to go live there. <laughs> and I just think that that's an interesting fact. A lot of people don't know mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I didn't know we, that. Yeah. We yeah. basically now Zionism is about the return to Israel. And Zionism goes back to the 19th century before World War One, even, and certainly World War Two, And that was where they were going to go. 
right? Like, and that's where, and, and I think the World War II obviously made it urgent, the right, the right to return, right? Um, and people would, were, were leaving by the millions all around the world to go to Israel. There's just this, so it, what I'm saying is, is the land matters. And I don't think we would have been able to court them and been like, well, I'll just go to Alaska instead. But you, you can imagine a world where we could have really reshaped world history away from the Middle East towards Alaska and some other alternate universe where we, the Slattery Plan went through. Alaska was heavily populated by um, Jewish people, Holocaust um, refugees and and all the rest. And so, yeah, th- th- that never happened, though. And obviously, and many millions of people were killed instead. So. <laughs> So yeah, that's the, that's the, and again, I don't want to put it on FDR. Like it's important to know that they didn't really know what was going on. It's true. Like it wasn't until the battle for Britain and maybe other things where we kind of had a better idea of what was going on with the concentration camp stuff. We had no satellite. I mean, you have to, no satellite imagery. You couldn't fly. There was no U2 bomber or anything like that. Like are you spy planes yet? We just didn't know. And so I think with, but I also think it was deeply rooted in anti-Semitism as well. Mm, that's unfortunate. That yeah. really is. Yeah, it was a very different time. Can you imagine? That would have made for a very different True Detective season four as well. It would have been a very different Alaska. Yeah, right? definitely. A uh, Yiddish Alaska. Jury's still out on that one, my friends. But uh I heard yeah. it sucks. I'm not I I'm not gonna I don't hate it. Yeah. I don't hate it. I like the one of the lead characters a lot. Um the arc, the character arc of that specific character is very interesting. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that before, but that's kind of anchoring it for me right now. Like, I don't, there's not too much else going. Like, Jodie Foster, she's got something really, if you think about her legacy as an actress, like if you think about her in Taxi Driver as a kid to being an actress now and being like, you know, basically somebody who's entering into that elderly sphere. As a performer, she's she's wonderful and she's a great character. She's kind of an unsavory character, but the acting is great. But there's something we I don't know. It's 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 building for me. I like it better and better with each. What are we on this weekend's going to be episode six, I think. So it has I think it has a shot. Plus, I'm hearing I don't mean to spoil this, but I'm hearing of a crossover between this and season one. Yeah, I heard that as well. So mm-hmm. we'll see with Rustin Cole character specifically. Which makes sense if you know season one and where he comes from and stuff. But Cutting yeah, a beer can. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so Dig, are you satisfied with uh Yeah, I mean also did you guys know starfish don't have blood? It's no, I didn't know that. Weird. Yeah. I guess they have to circulate nutrients and stuff, but they just if I'm understanding correctly, they ingest seawater in order to perform that function. They don't actually have blood. I don't know. I'm not a marine biologist. Starfish don't have blood. I read Damn. it, so I believe it. That's Except so strange. Patrick. Patrick has blood. Patrick has blood. Has they he bled in the, in the show? Right. I'm sorry. What did you say, Manny? I was going to ask. They, they're the ones that like regenerate. Like, if you were to cut off a piece of they stuff, do. Fish, it grows back, right? Yep. Yeah. They regenerate. Yep. That's, That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was watching a, a Nova. I love Nova. PBS Nova. And we were watching it about, Mike and I were watching it about whales. And it's so interesting. I never really thought about it. Ma- animals come out of the water, right? And then they they occupy land, and then that's where like a bunch of you know amphibians first, and then reptiles, and so on and so forth. And mammals come from the same thing, right? The whale evolved on land and went back in the water. Is that right? Yeah, this hmm. is a fact. Yeah, it's a fact. And what? the whole the whole Nova thing is about how. They were looking. They're they're finding these transitional fossils between these really weird land mammals that ultimately evolved into massive whales, and that they began by like going, you know, back in the water and then staying on the land, and then back in the water, and then just more and more in the water, more and more in the water, until they never went back to land at all. And then they lost their wow. feet. They lost like all the, and they became huge because they're no longer, you know, the biomass in the ocean is huge. Like, what do they call the praline or whatever the hell it is? The the, the weird teeth where they filter everything oh, and they just yeah, keep their mouths yeah, open yeah. so they just eat constantly mm-hmm. i was like that's so strange so that those motherfuckers went back in the water and that's why they breathe through the blowhole because they were saying they even had noses in front and then slowly natural selection oh, put so the blowhole weird. on the top of their head you know so they can just kind of mm. peek up and go down it's disturbing it's yeah. so weird when you think of the amount of time it took for that evolution to take place well it's like i can't wrap my head around that that's the thing about natural selection to me i find i find it truly strange like it's true. I don't dispute it at all. 
and we have all the sorts of like interstitial fossils. I mean, it's obvious as the day is long, but it's like, it's not smart. That's what, that's what people don't realize about natural selection is it's not doing anything. It's all weird adaptations that work and so are passed on. It's like, oh, this guy, this fucking dude's nostril went up three inches further up his head. And it was like, oh, and then he survived some combat with some animal because of it. And then it like passed it on to his ad- and they're like, oh, and so now that's the blowhole like mm-hmm. where that is. It's so, that's what I find so strange about it is there's no that's where intelligent design and all that kind of stuff. The more creationist stuff comes from about like, how could it be that there's no which I think is a somewhat compelling, though unscientific claim. The idea of saying, like, how could it be that this is all just happening? Mm. And I'm like, that's interesting. I don't know. But I, be- I, I believe that. that's a, a religious question in some sense. But I find that so interesting that like. Polar bears didn't over time get this like clear white coat or whatever, because that was what it was trying to do. It was an evolutionary thing that worked. And so it stayed. That's so strange to me. It really is. Because think of all the things that didn't work. Yeah, you know, like that's mm-hmm. the that's the fun stuff is like all the shit that didn't work and that we humans are really the only, and and domesticated animals are the only creatures on earth that basically have removed natural selection from rightfully so but like natural selection would call all sorts of people from society if if we didn't take care Twitter of them. users <laughs> what'd you say I said twitter users twitter users, yeah oh yeah people on twitter for sure but that's that's the dark thought like the other side of the coin is like we have a tolerance for that, which would be, you know, the other side of that would be like eugenics, which is crazy. I think part of what makes us human is taking care of the the less fortunate. Like you find Mike and I were just talking about this too. Like you find Neanderthals or not. We, we, they find Neanderthals, archeologists um, and paleontologists and whatever. And they, they often have, it's not uncommon for these skeletons or these bodies to have crazy, like really crazy injuries that they healed from indicating that people were taking care of them like someone with like a lost limb that was lost seemingly for 20 years or you know some crazy blow in their head where like it it, but they lived and that's so interesting so like we've been long circumventing like the person who got clubbed in the head by an uh, by an enemy should have naturally by natural selection died because he wasn't quick or smart enough to survive Mm. that's so interesting yeah it really is yeah there's a lot there all right. Dick, do we want to let you go now or? That's up to you guys. I mean, I have 40 minutes, so it's it, it, whatever's cleaner for you. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't. Okay. Well, um, let me see here. Brad, you had a topic, yes. but we had already did it. Do you have another one by chance? Oh, did you do it already? Yeah. Yeah. Dustin we said in the email, it's, uh, it's fuck. Yeah. Um, I presented two ideas if you need to borrow one. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's one, right. One very immature and one and one ridiculous. Or just if Maddie, you want to go first, and you could just think, Brad. Oh yeah, go ahead, Maddie. All yep, right, wait. So work. so yeah, let's just let I'm I'm gonna write a note just to cut this stuff out, but I'll keep this recording going, and then when Dagan leaves, we'll cut at that point. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, yeah. So I'm Maddie, take it away. Thing. Sure. All right, so yeah, my topic is time traveling. I uh, I was just rattling my head on this. Yeah, you know, like from the fun perspective, from the life decisions perspective, the the if you had the ability to do so, would you? Uh, ever since I was a kid, time travel always fascinated me. I'm like, technically, if you had the ability to time travel, like many a media has covered before, you know, you'd be able to kind of perfect your life. Like, you know, I make this decision instead of that decision. If you feel like you've made a bad mistake some point down the road, there's also the ability to time travel and just visit eras that we read about we've watched and you know we can only get so close like i uh, a channel that i'm i'm really fascinated by i'm I'm forgetting the name of the channel but they do these i've talked about it here on the show before they do these remastered videos of um of uh like like old 1940s for and 50s footage of all these random spots in the united states like here's what it was like in san francisco in the 40s and it's like 4k up res remastered footage and uh, you can see it and hear. You could feel like you're there. Uh, so I'm like, oh man, you know, it'd be kind of cool just to go back in time, visit that time, or stay a day, just see what it's like. You know, smell the roses along the way. Um, and so that's kind of my setup, more so. Um, and I want to kick it to you guys and just see: is there a period of time you would love to have visit? Is there 
a decision in your life that you know we would you would want to go back and undo because i'm of the mindset as i've i've thought about it more like when it comes to decision making like i feel even our greatest mistakes are, are i think any mature adult would recognize like they're super necessary for us to to get better obviously some mistakes more extreme than others but um I'm sure we all have our regrets at one point down the road or another. Would you go back and undo one of those um, to try to make that right? Or do you think about the butterfly effect of if I change that, do I get where I am today where I'm potentially pretty content? Um, for me, I would personally not want to change anything, even my my biggest of mistakes or uh, misjudgments or and so on, just because, again, I, I feel it's necessary to make the person I am today who I'm proud of. But uh, yeah, you guys can take it either way you want. The fun time travel point of view, the the life choices. I'm just curious where you would uh, stand on this. I was surprised this topic was available too. I was like, this is such a fun one. It's so a good one. Let's let's get Dag first. I think since mm. you know your time's a little limited, I want to make sure we 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 hear from you, Maddie. I'm so grateful somebody finally asked me this. I was ah, waiting. Yes. I've, I've been I'm waiting years away. for this. <laughs> been waiting years because I have I have a plan. Oh, <laughs> and now I finally get to share. It yeah, with somebody. yeah, you have a reason to bring it up. <laughs> So here, here's what I'm going to do, guys. Going to flash forward to sometime in the future okay. and hook up with a colonial marine. Now, listen, I'm not an idiot. I know it's not going to be aliens in the future, but whatever it, whatever kind of futuristic soldier is colonial marine adjacent. Mm. I want it to be very similar to a Vasquez type. But So I want to grab a colonial marine, you know, somebody that battles insidious aliens. Take him back or her back mm. in the time machine. Now we're going back to feudal Japan. Going to befriend a ninja. Okay. Get a grip. So now I got my ninja. I got my colonial marine. Got our ninja friend. We're going to hop back in the time machine. We're going to go in the back. We're going to grab Jesus. We're going back to biblical time. <laughs> this is the thing. This is the plan. We're forming a whole. This is a good one. We're going to form a gang. This is we're like Bill and Jesus. Ted. We're going to say, Jesus, guess where we're going? We're going back to the Mesozoic, baby. We're going to see the dinosaurs. Me, Jesus, the Colonial Marine, and the Ninja, going to go back to the Jurassic, maybe the Triassic, I don't know. And we're going to go check out the dinosaurs. We're not going to befriend the dinosaurs. We're just going to observe. Mm. Because that, and that has to be, I mean, every time somebody asks me about time travel, li li seriously, how can you not go back and see dinosaurs? That is complete, mm -hmm. that is the most compelling thing for because it's so it's so unbelievable for me to know that this existed like way before man these giant <laughs> kaiju roamed the earth <laughs> and we missed like the entire thing you know so that that's that's my that's my plan in a nutshell are you gonna and, like crack uh, a beer open with them like you know get, the dinos jesus a cold one and just watch as the as the stegosaurus rex just roams by like is that is that the game plan well I, I I am fascinated with meeting Jesus, but also a little selfishly, Jesus was in the group for protection. I know the wow. ninja and the colonial marine oh, are not sure. going to be able to handle things on their own, so <laughs> they were more for fun because <laughs> I always wanted to meet one. But Jesus could protect us from the dinosaur. He created those guys. Yeah, you don't forget. Well, you know, God the food. Father created the, the okay, dinosaur. Fine, fair <laughs> enough. He's watching out though. God, the Son didn't create them. And this, well, is why, and this is why Christianity, of course, is polytheistic, but we'll get into that another time. <laughs> I'm not being sacrilegious. Jesus is definitely the, the guy in my group after the ninja and the futuristic marine. So, yeah, and then you the, the get to see the dinosaurs. The only thing I don't know, I'm a, like an old dinosaur stand from being a kid, but I don't know. I get confused with what dinosaurs supposedly existed in which period yeah. and who was overlapping. Yeah, there that's that's something I don't know at much about. Like they there are dinosaurs. Like I think the T-Rex and the Brontosaurus for Brontosaurus, for instance, were not even on the planet at the same time. It's that's like exactly. weird shit like that. Like I don't know how that all lines up though. All right. So we'll hop around because I need to see the triceratops. I need to see oh, yeah. Steggy. I need oh, to see Stegosaurus. Yeah. I like the one is the Stegosaurus the one with the tail? Stegosaurus yeah. is the one with the down the middle. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, the plate like the armor. Plates. That's so cool. I love that. Mm-hmm. Let me see. Yeah. So that's it, man. That's easy peasy. I already, you know, I already had this answer. I've known this since I was seven years old. So thank you for finally letting me yeah. share. My I realized I said Stegosaurus Rex. It turns out that's a musical artist. I meant the, the Stegosaurus. The Stegosaurus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that right? I did do a, in, I have a special bond with the Stegosaurus. I'm not really a dino head, but 
Stegosaurus I connect with because I had a little project in second grade and I had to make one. It came out quite well. So mm. that's the that's the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah. What's Brontosaurus called now? It's like Brachiosaurus. I thought they no, like changed no. the name of it. They changed it. You're right though. They did change it. Brachiosaurus is that one with the blowhole. It looks like a Brontosaurus for the yeah. water. Dude, it's so hard to believe these things are real. Like their necks are like two miles long. It's insane. Like, I I become really skeptical though of this level of paleontology where over the decades it's become clear that dinosaurs don't look or at least like we have this assumption about the way they looked the way their skin was all this kind of stuff and really like it's not true like we Mm -hmm. don't really know for sure I hate when things are posited and then taken for a fact and then you you listen to like these deep you know that paleontologist that's on Joe Rogan once in a while like the the heavy set guy with the beard he's great I like that guy a lot Um, they'll get into it and it's like so much deeper than that. You know, it's like maybe they had like these transitional feather type things and mm-hmm. it's just, it's, it's so, it's so weird. And, and we, we, it's so interesting how little we know about them. Dagan, you'll see the dinosaurs, I think. And I'm not even being facetious in a Jurassic park sort of way. It's like, we, they're going to revive mammoths. I think in the coming years, I mean, that is going to happen. And, and I don't see why the second they find proper genetic, you know, like in, in, in the story of Jurassic Park and like the Crichton story, they find mosquitoes in 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 amber and get the DNA from that. You're going to need to that figure story. that out because it's so old that it would be heavily degraded. Mammoths are only 10, 12, 15,000 years old. So, mm. but um, the last time I, I saw that guy on, I think it was him on on Rogan. He was talking about that place in Alaska, that private place in Alaska where they found like a shit ton of mammoths and all. You know what I'm talking about? Like it was. I don't it's know. It's like some I private piece of land. There's an amazing video of it, of it, of them just like spraying almost like a fire hose at this, this like, I guess they get, I don't know what they get out of this usually when they're doing it. Like they're doing it for some reason and it's eroding away all of the silt and shit that came with glacier movement, I guess. And they're just whittling it away and mammoth, bo- like entire mammoths are just sticking out of it, like dead. No way. I got to watch yeah, this. Yeah. It's, it's like amazing. Like they have huge tusks. Like they're just taking these things out. It's, they're just amateurs. And it's so cool, man. It's just so, so neat. So they have all that stuff in that. They're going to revive those, those motherfuckers are going to be walking around in a zoo in the next <laughs> 10 years, I think, which is so interesting. How do you guys, That's how do you feel insane. about that? The woolly mammoth. I yeah. love it. I love it. Saber tooth tiger. Give me a saber tooth yeah, tiger it. as well. Do it. You Not know? quite as cool as like T-Rex and Triceratops, but if I had to take them, that's fine. Yeah, Give I'd take them, in. but it's not yeah. nearly as cool. We already got no, a bunch of big cool. cats. I guess the closest we got to dinosaurs is like reptiles mm-hmm. still, you know, birds, birds, mm, technically. Yeah. Thing. But yeah, I want to like a T-Rex. Like I know it's going to break loose and eat a bunch of people, which sucks, but I feel like we kind of need that as humanity. Um, imagine we did do that and then it turned into Jurassic Park and they're like, dude, it, like it would. <laughs> we how did we fall for this trap? You know, like right, how did Spielberg warn? They warned us. Right. It's it's so funny. Several would, times. Yeah, on several occasions. They escaped the <laughs> island. They got to the mainland. It all it all fell apart. I'd be really, really excited to see that because we long thought, I think, and there's still theories banding around about this, but I think that the theory was is that, oh, is that human hunting obliterated these various megafauna animals. And I think now it's assumed that it was the younger Dryas, like that whole situation with maybe a huge flood and comet mm-hmm. in, or an, an asteroid impact like 10, 12,000 right. years ago might have done them in. So it so. They might not either way, they didn't go away because they sucked. They went away because they were they were subjected to Mother Nature in some way. And let's so let's bring those motherfuckers back. Let's bring them back. The woolly mammoth, dude, that would be so sick. That would be so sick. That would be insane. So cool. cool. I think you have to, as I understand, I don't know, someone people, other people who know this better than me is I'm pretty sure you have to impregnate another animal with it, though. Right? Like, isn't that what you would you can't just do it in a this is like the whole Dolly thing with the, the cloning of the sheep in the 90s. Like you would have to impregnate something with it and have Do you it. You have to impregnate and like it has to, it has frog DNA, right? To fill in the gap or whatever yeah, and in the genetic code. Yeah. Like you need to gestate it somehow. I think you, mm. you, we don't have like back the tanks or shit, <laughs> shit like that. I so. wish. That's like my, uh, that's like one of my dreams, man. To, oh, to, to go in the back the tank? Like a back the tank. Like, you know, it's like, damn, I really got roughed up. You just sit in that thing. Five oh, minutes. you want some it's, Dragon Ball shit? Yeah, yeah, and just step on out. All right, good as new. Let's do that again. <laughs> right? Oh, God, it'd be so fucking cool. <laughs> it's like Luke's in that empire. Yeah, that's yeah, it. That's it. Dude. Yeah. 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 
that's that's my vision of it personally. I, yeah, I love that. It, it reminds me of Weapon X as well um, in X Men. Mm-hmm. All right, Brad, where are you on this on on traveling through time? <sighs> through time, I'd like the idea of assembling some RPG group like Damon was doing or uh, yeah, <laughs> Dagan was doing. I love that. It reminds me of Bill and Ted in a great way. And I thought when Maddie was talking about like redoing stuff in my life, I'm kind of with Maddie in the same boat as like mistakes were made and I regret some things, but I wouldn't be who I am without them. So I don't know if I could actually go back and change them because maybe stuff would get worse. You know, you think about mm. the whole butterfly effect or whatever. It's like, what would happen if I don't know, I stole a Twix bar Would the world explode just from small, some small thing like that. Kind of freaks me out, dude. Like, I don't know if I could do that. Yeah, like someone who who needed a Twix bar that day was really pissed off they didn't get it, so they just hit the big yeah. red button because they just they're they're a little hungry that day. And <laughs> yeah, because well, you took that Twix, man. I heard a joke about like someone saying like, "What if Hitler? What if they lit Hitler in art school or something like that? Would mm. would everything just be okay, mm. or would someone some other tyrant come up in his place or something like that?" She's like. I don't know, man. Those people were such assholes. BBG? Hitler's art was good. Like, if you look oh, yeah. at it, good? yeah, it's good. I don't know if I've I don't know why. It. Like, what's wrong? Why can't this guy be in school? You fucked every. These people fucked us all up. Maybe he <laughs> did an interview and he was a complete dickhead, so they didn't let him in or something. I don't know how he got in art school then, but I don't know. It's too scary, man. But I would like yeah. to go to the past. That would be pretty rad. I don't. I'm scared to go back super far because everything's so fucking dangerous. Feel like you would just tr- time travel back in time and get a disease immediately mm. and just die. <laughs> like going to see like Jesus would be cool as hell, but like everyone's going to be speaking Hebrew Aramaic. or whatever Aramaic, and you're not going to be able to understand anyone. I guess Jesus would be able to understand you, but I don't know. They'd probably think you're a witch and kill you or something like that. Yeah, yeah. we're just looking like us right now. Like right, like Brad, you look completely normal. If you went back two hundred years and were seen. Even mm-hmm. that short a period of time ago, they would just be like, what the, f-? they would just run you up on a, on a stake. Yeah. Imagine yeah. Dagan pitching to Jesus, this time travel adventure and his anime tea and beanie. They'd be like, who the fuck are you, man? They'd put you, yeah. on, they'd put you on the cross next to him. Probably. <laughs> yeah, exactly, dude. <laughs> no. Yeah. You bringing up Hitler does beg the question of like time travel. It's really hard to like, not talk about like, do you go back and change those sorts of things? Right. Like, do you, change the course of history like you go back you warn everyone like this guy is going to do something pretty fucking awful mm-hmm. let him into art school like, yeah you change let that, him in. right yeah it would be i would it would have changed the whole that it really does change the whole context of human history Amazing. since yeah since the 20s and 30s for 100 yeah. years it's it is it is fascinating there are so many things like that i i am also loath to go back though and fuck around with things because the thing that hasn't come up is that you're it, it's come up in a grander way but Say you go back and treat someone better, or like fix a personal problem. Like you're also changing their reality. Right. And right. Yeah. Which they might also not want. Like, for instance, you might have broken up with someone or whatever, and then they went and found their significant other that they're still with today. And if you didn't did that differently or you may remain friends or whatever, I don't know. I always think about that because that going back in time, I, I there are things I would I would like to see what would have happened if things went differently. But I don't want that to be the reality necessarily. Mm-hmm. Digging and I have gone into those extensively on on knockback in the past. The various things that I think would be interesting to see things differently from my my our parents getting divorced to all sorts of different trajectories that things are set on. But I am afraid of changing the reality of where I am now by messing around with any of that. So if it was divorced from that, I think the only thing that I would go back and really ch- want to change is just the way things went down with certain people in my life. You know, just old friends, old girlfriends, things like that, where it's mm-hmm. just like you didn't leave things, you didn't have to do that. You didn't, I wasn't really ever horrible, but it's like you didn't. It could have been different. The, the thing about t- traveling back in time is that you have the context of wisdom. I know so much more now than I did when I was 20, for instance, or 15, obviously. And so almost fixing your problems through that lens is almost unnatural because you weren't this person then. You became mm-hmm. this person through that situation and many others. So, so there's that butterfly effect sort of thing. But I just think things have some bad things have happened in my life and some great things have happened in my life. I just think it, it it is what it is to go back in time and be an observer of things would be so much different. And I often think about even going back in time and just being the one that's 
like just imagine going back in time with whatever you wanted with a small group of people and just kind of visiting different societies and just being like, look at this crazy shit we can do and like what we know and and all of this. Mm-hmm. I think that that would be it would be witchcraft, but at the same time, it would probably be insanity. I mean, imagine the conquistadors landing in South and Central America. It's a, they were totally different civilizations. It would almost be like that where we would be have we could have all these weapons and all this technology and all these things and these people would have no fucking idea mm-hmm. what what to do or what you just pull, pull up a gun and just shoot someone with it right <laughs> and they'd be like they would have no concept of anything you just did yeah the fucking ballistics of it and the what the hell is that and what's in it and what they would think it was like a magical item that yeah, kind of shit i always bad. think it would be super interesting just to witness and i don't want to shoot anyone but just something like, like bringing a phone and showing showing a phone to benjamin franklin like someone who would get it if you just sat down and explained it to them That'd be wild. Mm -hmm. They would have no concept. Do you have any idea how many things you'd have to explain to them to just get to this point? (laughs) Yeah. Like you have to go back and and by the way, he would be like, it'd be like, oh, that electricity from the kite. Right. Here it is. Here, buddy. Yeah. 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 Um, Hold on. I love the. Yeah. Who are you going back? What are you changing? Are you going back and stopping John Wilkes Booth? Are Um, you seeing went down with Kennedy? Kennedy, no, mm. I don't know. John Wilkes Booth is interesting just because that. The whole John Wilkes Booth thing in, in 1865 is interesting just because it's before term limits. And the Republicans had so much power during that time because the Democrats have been totally defenestrated and they were the Confederates for the most part. You could imagine Lincoln being president for a long time. Mm-hmm. I, I, I often think about that with with a few others as well, but. Like FDR got to his fourth term, but not really. Everyone knew he was dying even when he was running for his fourth term. So well, behind the scenes. So I always think about that with John Wilkes Booth about that would have changed the trajectory of like Lincoln was This is so nerdy, but Lincoln was like a very moderate Republican. He famously said he would have kept the union together and not got rid of slavery if that would have worked. Right. And the Republicans in the House and in the Senate were known as radical Republicans, and they were way crazier, like way more radical, as the name suggests. And so Lincoln was much more of a let's shake hands and like get over this sort of thing, while the radical Republicans were much more like, let's make sure these people pay the price for what they've done. And that was kind of tempered by Andrew Johnson when he took over after. It's just interesting to think like Reconstruction would have gone totally different. You can imagine Mm -hmm. you can imagine almost a much stronger Southern racial identity had Lincoln lived, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm sorry, you guys. I was selfish. I want to add a step in my adventure. Yeah, go ahead. I want to take my ninja friend mm-hmm. and I want to stop over in 1930s Germany and assassinate Hitler. <laughs> the ninja. Where my ninja friend's <laughs> going to. I'm just going to sort of, I'm going to pull the strings. He'll I'm blend be, right in. I'm, I'm going to be the logistics guy. What would have been, know? I mean, that would have been great for bloodshed. What would it be more interesting from the historical point of view is if he was assassinated during the war? <laughs> Seriously, what would have. I mean, they'd, his no, own people, his own people tried to assassinate him. Before the atrocities take, before the atrocities. Well, no, I, I, I'm saying, I, that's what I just said. It's like from a personal point of view, it's it's different. But from a historical point of view, it would just be interesting to see like how they would have gotten that. Like there was an idea, and I think Valkyrie's about this, like the movie. that oh, that, that, about that movie. That the Nazis would go on without him, you know, in some different way. They would still be the Nazis. It would be interesting to see what that would have looked like would it would in other words like would they have been some sort of normalized society or something i don't don't know from an historical Mm. point of view i think that that's much more interesting but from a from a personal point of view of course you'd want to do it before (laughs) that but again that would change that's such a heavy thing dude like i don't know that you want to fuck around with that that's that's the kind of that's the gravity of the choice like it sounds good but the repercussions could be well you might just kick the war into the future with a different in a different situation with bigger weapons mm-hmm. and better mm-hmm. weapons like the fact that we fought the war when we did is ideal if we fought the war 15, 10 years later we would have fucking destroyed each other we went over mm. yeah, you know? i never thought of that that's a good point that brings the question up of <clears throat> dragon ball fans know what i'm talking about here like there's this character trunks he time travels from the future and comes back and he's like pretty much like hey we're all we're all fucked at this point my question would be, because we've talked a lot about the past, personal choices, observing, forming a JRPG party to take on the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> would you guys go forward and just see what's happening? Like, I, I'm sure out of curiosity, of course, mm. but let's say you went forward and it's like, oh, wow, you know, we're we're dead. We, well, we cease yeah. to exist. well, that's not I mean, what's so fascinating about that to me, Maddie, is that that's not sci fi. 
Like we know how to go forward in time and we could do it. Like we just have to have the, the will to do it. Like that is physically possible. And you just can't return to where, mm. you know, to where you've come. come. But we know mm. that the faster you go, the, the, the more time slows down. And so traveling very fast and then coming back to the point in which you traveled from many, 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 many more years, orders of magnitude would have passed than what you experienced personally. And that's how you would travel through time, you know, and interstellar gets into all that and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that would be fucking sick. Now we're talking about Chrono Trigger. You know? Yeah, really? Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. <clears throat> a lot of JRPG stuff going on. Yeah. So, yeah, I would love to. I mean, it is kind of dark to that. That's what's cool about the, the idea of traveling back and forth is like Terminator style is kind of neat, you know, um, where you're able to kind of like access all of the realities and try to manipulate them. But traveling forward in time, I think, would be as mind blowing for us as it would be for Franklin to see the iPhone in some mm-hmm. sense. Imagine mm-hmm. all the things they would have to explain to us. You know? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Wow. I love thinking about that. You know, would you guys, would you guys, I'm sure the answer is no, but I mean, would you consider if someone was like, we can put you in this spaceship, send you three quarters of the speed of light in one direction for a year, bring you back 10,000 years would have passed or whatever it is, you know, um, would you do it? No, no way. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Fuck much, no. Too much to give up. It's so that would be, <clears throat> that is a lot to give up. It would be so wild to experience that. Yeah. Like in yeah. Re- in your gauged reality, two years have passed. And then you come back and everything is it, it would make no sense. That's insane. You know? <clears throat> Very interesting stuff. Relative. It, it really uh, is. I guess you could take a page out of click where you can just kind of quickly just hit oh. the button and <laughs> go back. How how reckless would you get if you had that ability? Like one of the scenes I love from that movie is where he fucking slaps the shit out of his boss farts in his face and then like and then resumes play and the guy's like oh i just feel like i got hit by a bus <laughs> <laughs> as a kid i fucking thought that's that sandler was hilarious. right and, um, yeah it was yeah. Adam sandler yeah um, i i thought that movie was hilarious as a kid because that scene alone like i thought it was so brilliant because it was such an empowering concept of like yeah there's so many people i would just stop time slap the shit out of resume and just sit there peacefully like oh, okay <laughs> um would you guys abuse that sort of power if you had it absolutely dude yeah absolutely. i feel like everyone would get curious yeah, yeah in yeah. the moment yeah it, it seems not. less unholy because it's in the moment like yeah. starting a butterfly mm. effect two seconds ago it's like who cares yeah, <laughs> yeah. no there's there are no you don't know what's going to happen anyway so the consequences could be grave but you would have you'd be none the wiser in that point so like yeah, yeah. I, I would i would dig that more yeah no. Yeah, that, <laughs> I'm just thinking that movie, man. He like pauses time. I think when he finds his his wife with another guy, he pauses time, and just kicks him in the nuts like three fucking times in a row. <laughs> Such a, I don't know. I I enjoy that movie a lot, but all right, that that I, I'm good with my topic personally. That'd I thought that fun. I'm Damn. satisfied, but I'm always open to hearing more thoughts. Now I'm thinking about click, man. <laughs> think how easy it'd be to rob a bank with that or something. You'd be yeah, some crazy going, huh? ass shit with that. Just stop wow. time. Walk into the vault, help yourself, leave, <laughs> resume. Who's going to know? Really. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's the least troubling to me because yeah. because the consequences seem they, they're not cosmically grave, you know, yeah. like like the other ones would be. Yeah, minor like, personal gain. <laughs> like I, because I, the more interesting one even than Hitler is going back to World War One and stopping that from happening, specifically because mm-hmm. World War Two is a continuation of World War One directly. So there would be Hitler would still exist and do whatever, but he would have no power, and like he wouldn't be who he was if not for the Versailles Treaty and all that shit, the stab in the back and all that kind of mm-hmm. kind of stuff. So, but it would be, I just the reality is like the theory of it would be it would just be these brewing conflicts would happen eventually and it would just again it would just be so much worse we part of the pun dodged some bullets i think for for war ha- like global co- total war happening like that before we really like it would just be unthinkable to have imagine world war one happening in 1940 world war two happening 1970 yeah oh yeah. man can you imagine that's a great alternate history sort of revisionist concept yeah it's kind of like wolfenstein ish in some way yeah Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. like where the war never like where the nazis win and you just or man in the high castle man in the high castle is really it's funny i I, that this didn't come up actually man in the high castle is really about this i mean it really is yeah you're right and and uh 
the man, the man in the high castle is an awesome Amazon sh- uh, show based on a book, but the show really goes into how there are the, the Nazis and the Japanese win the war world war two and split the United States in half. Mm-hmm. And there are these, re- there's just like this rebellion of people who have discovered that there are alternate realities that, that can be that the Nazis have basically manipulated all. There's an awesome scene with Hitler in it, actually, like a guy playing Hitler where he has like all these videos, like they're like round cassettes or whatever. And he like, and they're all the realities of like how the war could have gone, but didn't. And that's what the show's about. So people can hmm. check that out. If they that's, want. A really good, good. that's a good one. I always forget about that show. You know, what? Me, why don't me and my ninja and my wizard and my Marine, why don't we go back? Your wizard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Party needed yeah, a wizard, sure. yeah. And we th- we could thwart AI. We could just fuck everything else. We could just make sure AI never gets to this point. That would be that would be my dream. I'm changing everything. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. That's my dream. Fair this enough. way, I could still have a career and everything. Okay. What if Jesus yeah. stopped you though and was like, "It's all part of the plan"? No, <laughs> you think he would be pro AI? He might be. I don't know. <laughs> well, if you believe if you're a Calvinist, it, it would this would have been known, you know predestined so Mm. oh wow that's getting too deep yeah that's why i think uh, the whole no free will thing i just can't get down with like that that's a very popular thing now in like in pops in pop um philosophy right now with like sam harris and stuff the idea that and and jaffe's a huge believer of it like that you have no free will that you're that you thinking you have free will is in itself just a biological construct. Oh, just like zero autonomy. Basically, saying that there's a this is Jaffe's argument for creativity and why he thinks it thinks it's not as profound as we think it is, which is that like b- the base reality of everything is a chemistry and biological equation. The, re- the you're reacting to something is predestined with your chemical makeup. Oh, I never and knew this. it's about. Yeah. To me, and, and so obviously Calvinism gets into that where it's that even if you are in the moment and think you're making the different choice, it's already known that you are thinking about that and then you are making the different choice. That is such a mm. defeatist way of living that I can't, I can't get around yeah. that idea. It's just so, it's, it's in hock to, to a God, basically, that mm. control. I'm like, eh, I don't, I'm not into that. But a lot of people, Sam Harris makes interesting arguments about, against free will for those same kinds of things that there's just... Because he's probably literally true, but figuratively, that's not true. So anyway, are we all satisfied with this topic? Yeah, I am. What's, what's so funny, Brad? No, I'm just thinking about like this whole thing about free will is so insane to me. And like people, you got to have hope, man. If they oh, don't hope have hope is- and it's just like, what's the fucking point, dude? Yeah, a lot, a lot of doomers online. Yeah, it's so much dooming. Yeah, and, and it's just. Even if it's literally true that you have no choices because but it's still a makeup of something in you that makes the choice mm-hmm. like why would you want to reduce it so much to that now, like right, what's the right, point right. it's very strange exactly. yeah. very strange it's not important to have free will maybe as long as we think we do and that's maybe enough right that that's we think exactly. we're in control right. Is. right because to reduce it all to that says that there's no no one has control over anything you know and I just, what's the point then? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, that's some Dada yeah. shit right there. Yeah, no doubt. All right, Dick, should we say goodbye to you? Yeah, I'm going to Florida, guys. Goodbye. Oh, oh shit. I'm so hey. sorry to have to leave, actually, but I'm not sorry to go on vacation. I'll be honest. Where are you going? Where, where in Florida? We're going to Marco Island by way of Fort Myers. Oh, okay. Fort and you're Myers staying how long? And drive down to uh, Marco Island. How long are you staying? We'll be back on Wednesday. Okay. Oh, is it, yeah. is it like February break? Yeah. They, the kids only have, we don't have like a proper break, but they, they're off Friday, Monday. So they only miss like a couple of days of school. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. It'll be nice. All right, man. Have fun. First non Disney Florida vacation, actually. Nice. Whoa. Say hi to Trump. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'll say, hey, <laughs> say hi to him. I'll say hi to DeSantis. Yeah. Say hi to Ron DeSantis. Say hi to everybody down there. <laughs> Give Mickey. My, my kindest regards. Um, all right, my friend. Well, goodbye right, to you. you Let's uh, we'll stop here and say goodbye to you. Okay, we've said goodbye to Dagan, who's off to Florida, and now that leaves us with Brad. We needed to have uh, a new topic brought up, Brad, because you wanted mm-hmm. to do arcade, but we looked into our document and realized we already did that topic. There's Dustin. You so, said, uh, uh, it Dustin? yeah, he might. Yeah, that sounds like something he would do. Yeah, so, <laughs> uh, a user thankfully has compiled 
all of our topics into a document. So because we've already had repeats, which is crazy, because when I when we used to do the Game Over Greggy show, it kind of funny, which is the similar idea that I came up with then Mm -hmm. we never had that problem. So I don't know. I'm becoming more predictable and and more boring as time goes on, I think. (laughs) Um, But anyway, hit us up with uh, your topic and let's get into it. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about it all started when I was thinking about environments and video games first of all like just being in a landscape or a setting and it just affecting you how you feel some you look at something like in a game or something and you feel a certain way about you feel comfy maybe at a certain thing like i was thinking back maddie you could probably appreciate this like traverse town and kingdom hearts you feel very cozy in there stuff like that then i was kind of thinking about how that's like in real life out here the world we live in the planet earth with so many different types of geography and biomes and like where I live is Southern California and like 20, 25 minutes from me is the beach or something like that. And 45 minutes or an hour away is the mounds of snow. I'm just thinking about how I can go from these different areas of what they all make me feel like. And I just kind of wanted to know, like, what do you guys prefer setting wise? Where do you like to be? What makes you feel good? Or what place are you like, man, I would never want to be there ever. Like, would you never mm. want to live in a desert or anything like that? Yeah. For, so for me, I, I've remarked before that the two hot places, like uh, not so much where you are, but if you go to Palm Springs and all that kind of right. stuff, it's just like so yeah. fucking hot. Yeah. You know, um, I don't know how anyone li- I don't know how anyone lived there before modernity i often wonder that like i think about los angeles even in like the 1900s like what the fuck were you guys doing it must have been (laughs) horrifying 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 or when i'm reading these books like uh, cormac mccarthy books that take place in the southwest in the 1800s it's like it must have been miserable absolutely miserable yeah i don't want to be anywhere where it's too hot sure other than that this is pretty good you are uh here in virginia right yeah it's it's hot yeah in the summers it's hot right now it's like 50 degrees okay um but yeah, it gets really hot and muggy here in the summer and not like Florida muggy, but but pretty bad. Right. And, um, you know, I grew up on the beach on Long Island. Everyone grows up near the beach on Long Island. You mm-hmm. can't not grow up on the, near the beach on Long Island. And I, I took that for granted and I enjoy that. But I've always lived on water because when I lived in Boston, I lived in San Francisco, I lived in L.A. and Santa Monica specifically, which is on the water. And so this was this living here in, in Virginia is the first time I'm living away from the water and I don't really miss it, which means that I don't know that I really love it that much. I think what I love about settings is I love the woods, mountainous kind of shit. I think uh, a really great example of this is Tahoe in Northern California. It's just so beautiful mm-hmm. and so interesting. But uh, as far as like biome, like the specific s- setting of weather and, and all that, I think San Francisco is perfect. Now, everything about San Francisco is fucked up except for its weather. The weather, yeah. But it's really the nice. weather is so perfect in San Francisco. It's always if you don't if you don't mind not having sun half the year, but you don't really get rain either, except for in rainy season for a couple months. It's pretty ideal. It's just sweatshirt weather all the time. And I mm-hmm. I, I loved that part of it. I took that for granted. I lived in the sunset, which is right on the ocean there as well. And it was just always nice, cool wind. I'd have my sliding door. No one has AC in San Francisco, which is so interesting because it never gets really hot there. And that's why it's always a big deal in games media when it gets really hot and everyone's whining because no one has AC. I would just have my sliding door in my bedroom open facing the water, you know, blocks away, but facing the water, you have that wind come in at night. It was so perfect. But um, I really do like the wooded mountainous kind of situation myself. And that, that that's what I would prefer. It's just the nicest balance of winter and summer, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, like, what's preventing you from doing that? Is it just family where you what state you'd want to live in or something like that or a part of the world keeping you from doing that? Yeah, I think I'm kind of in. We're in a, a pretty wooded space now, Okay, not in our neighborhood because they knock the woods down to build it. But, um, you know, I'm southwest of Richmond. And so it's pretty suburban rural out here. Like there's a street called Hull Street. That's a, like a huge road in my area. And if you go left on Hull Street from where we live, it's all crowded. It's like just strip malls and fucking super stores and all sorts of things. And if you go right, it's just empty. And mm-hmm. that's going to be developed, I'm sure, in the decades to come. But Micah and I talk about going and getting like a or build, we want to. So my house was a, a what's called a spec house. and so it's a new house, but it, it wasn't built for me. It was built by the builder to 
either sell or test things out or whatever. And it's common for neighborhoods to have these and they, they kind of sell them off. They're just like, okay, whatever. And, and most of the other houses are like custom made to people's specifications. So what's in this house is just what the builder wanted to do. And it would be cool to build another house and I would like to do that. And we talk about like where we would want to do that. And I'd like to do it on more land in the woods. The Blue Ridge Mountains are in West, the Western part of Virginia, not West. West Virginia is great too. I wouldn't mind living over there at some point or having a house there. My family has a beach house. My, my mom specifically has a beach house in New Jersey. And she, I, I don't, I haven't been there in years, but uh, she talks about selling it. And maybe we would pool our money as some, in some sort of family thing and have something more in the mountains instead, mm -hmm. which I think would be pretty cool. So nothing's really stopping me. I just, I also have a, a fixation with this house in some sense where it's like the realization of everything I always wanted. And so I can never imagine selling it. And maybe I'll be in a position where I can just hold it or give it to someone in the family like to or rent it out or something. But I don't I don't imagine I'll ever get rid of this place either. Yeah, so I think that's a yeah. good feeling, though. You found yeah. your home, man. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah I just it I, I never, you know, <laughs> I, I overstated. I leave the house, but I'm always in my house. I work from home. I'm always mm -hmm. here. And it's just your space and your yeah. whole like existence. My whole existence is really in this house. So yeah. it's and in the neighborhood around it and all that. So. Yeah, I it would be difficult for me to imagine leaving it, especially because and again, this would go into something my ex would, you know, analyze me about if, if she heard me say, which is like, oh, that's just a reflection of your childhood, you know, because you were always moving and moving around and stuff. So now you, mm. you refuse to move. And so I mean, that, that's something I had to take in, into account. But I think my dad. So my dad built a, a new house. He lives in, in the Hamptons and on Long Island um, with his wife and they built a new house on this lake. And it's awesome. And it's awesome. It's totally dope. And I saw it when it was being built. And in my, I was still at IGN when he was building it. And in my mind, I was like, this is kind of cool. Everything is specifically custom made for you. Like every little thing. And I think that if I just opened my mind to that and said like, no, though you have to leave this place and it's going to be difficult for you to do it. Imagine a space that is totally custom made to your exact specifications on a big piece of land instead of in a neighborhood. So it's uh, anything's possible, you know, but I'm pretty content right now. And I don't. I'm happy living below my means and just kind of hanging out. I don't want mm -hmm. I don't want for much, you know, I, I don't say that as like, oh, look at me and look how noble I am. I just I don't really want for much. I don't No, I think that's a healthy outlook and mindset to have because you'll just be happier if you don't constantly need. I guess that kind of ties into your earlier topic. But yeah, I think that's great that you feel so good about where you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good. Yeah, so that's Maddie, my answer, I think. Yeah, I think it's good, Matty. Let's talk about you, man. Yeah, I I, really, I like this topic a lot, man, because I, <clears throat> as a northeasterner, I, you know, I I I really like this cycle of weather we mm -hmm. have here. You don't really spend too too long on any one particular weather pattern, and anytime like oh, like we got hit with a lot of snow recently, it's like anytime we get hit with a lot of snow. There's that feeling of like, oh, this is a pain in the ass, like shoveling the driveway, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, making sure that everything's salted, et, et cetera, et cetera. Driving can be a little more risky now and, and so on and so forth. But it's like phases. It's like these phases of life almost like I, I can't imagine my life without the 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 annual winter cleanups and whatnot. Uh, I love that spring in the Northeast is very cool and uh you know like t-shirt shorts weather and the summers get pretty high and it's like well okay like i'm always looking forward to the next thing during that season mm -hmm. and it's hard to imagine my life without that like a lot of people are always like man it's just always hot on the west coast it's always hot it was, it was interesting to hear what you said about san francisco Colin, because that's completely news to me like i always was of the understanding that like you know if you're in la like it's just fucking roaring hot and maybe my perception of that was warped because like I only had gone there in June for E3. So, oh, yeah, that's yeah. yeah. So well, I'm San, there yeah, San Francisco like, and L.A. are just very different. Yeah, they yeah. Are. yeah. Yeah. San Francisco has like its own weird weather system. Yeah, like there's like a San there. Francisco is on the end of a peninsula. Mm, and yeah, from, yeah, from that perfect. peninsula at the top of the peninsula, San Francisco, and then it's like South San Francisco, Daly City and San Mateo and all that kind of stuff. And it's just got its own little microclimate. And once mm, you go, once you go south to the valley, like where Apple and all the computer companies are in Silicon Valley or north across the bridge to Cupertino and Marin, then the weather totally changes. And yeah. so by the time you get to wine country, it's hot as fuck again. Mm, and by the okay. time you get to San Jose, it's hot as fuck again. Or if you go 
like east towards I guess that would I don't even know what that would be like Stockton or something. It's hot as fuck again. It's just this mm. very weird microclimate. That's why that they say that the huge trees grow in that area as part of that as well, because it never gets so, you know, like the, the redwoods and it never really rains. They just get like misted kind mm. of. Yeah. 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 No, it, it's really interesting to hear that because my perception was always that. And I'm like, or, or I think a more accurate one would be like Florida, like the older people are known to just go down to Florida during the winter or sometimes just leave the, you know, New York or in general, just to just because they're tired of the cold and. I never understood like this desire to just not see other weather patterns. Like I have uh, three very close friends who all live in Florida and like snow is just this anomaly to them. They're like, our shit would shut down with that. I had a friend who moved to South Carolina and when it snowed an inch, they, they shut down school for like two days. Um, mm-hmm. Like it, So I, I love in the Northeast, like New York, Connecticut, like this sort of cycle of weather we get because each one to, to your original point, Brad pulls a different mood out of me. Like when I walk out when, after a snow has fallen and it's like untouched, like no one's walked across it. It's just like silence. Uh, I love that feeling because like I, you know, I've, I've been in the city, like New York city before and um, stayed there for a while. It's just loud and so many people. And I don't like that. So that piece hits me differently. There are certain sites like, I associate summer with this walk when I when I lived at my parents, I would go on this route and I'd end up on this hill. I think there was because there was a memory sort of baked into that hill. Um, But it was like I would oversee a lot of the town I lived in. And I was like, it was just a good place to sit and reflect. It's Mm -hmm. the way I because you brought up Traverse Town, Brad. I thought of um, the tower that they'd sit on that just oversees. Oh, Twilight Town. Yeah. Yeah. Where they had like the the sea salt ice cream and everything, uh, it, it, I, it's kind of like that, but way less extravagant and elegant. I was just like, oh, it's <laughs> cool. It's like a, it was like my reflective spot. So I feel like certain environments pull that out of me, and I wouldn't want to live somewhere where like the weather is super consistent with like mm-hmm. you know one type, so to say. Um, like of course it rains everywhere, it gets hot everywhere, but. Things like the snow, I think, are like a needed dynamic in my life. It creates some sort of balance, I guess, that I that I want and I appreciate where like I've always said, like when I was growing up in New York, um, you know, I mean, Connecticut's basically New York anyway. So when I moved out, it wasn't like I was missing much. I was like, I don't you know, I had so many friends who were like, I can't wait to get the fuck out of here. I'm like, why? I was like, this is I think this is great. Like, I mm-hmm. really maybe I'm in a bubble. But I was like, I really don't want for much here. It's not too many people, not too little. There's everything's down the road. All my friends are in this like general circumference. Like this is pretty nice. Like I don't really see, like I feel like I got really lucky with where I was born. I certainly have friends who were like, I got to get out of here and I get it. But um, yeah, man, like I, I always felt pretty lucky that I, I, you know, was born in New York and I was like, this is definitely mm-hmm. where I was meant to be. I, I would not want to be anywhere else. Yeah. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I'm super happy with where I'm, was born and raised and I love it here too, but I always was super jealous of snow. Mm. It's like it never snows here. Like it gets kind of cold, but it's never like snow. Like it's 63 degrees right now where I'm at. It's like cool, but we don't get the, the season experience, I guess like so many other places do like the leaves or whatever you guys get in the fall and all that kind of stuff. Like, in the fall, it could still feel kind of like summer here. It could still sure. be hot. So I do miss all that. But like, man, the pain in the ass that comes with some of the weather. Also, sure. like the snow and all that shit. It's just like, I think it'd be cooler if I was younger. But now that I'm older, I'd have to like deal it with it more. more. <laughs> yeah, like, have you been yeah. in snow, Brent? Where yeah, you, I've been in travels? snow. Yeah. yeah, I've been in snow. And like, I've been in the mountains. Like there's mounds for me. They're like 90 minutes where, you know, you right. go snowboarding, all that stuff. And my brother lives in um minnesota right now so it snows like crazy all that shit there too so i've been around it but mm-hmm. i do love it but i just don't know if i'd want to like deal with it all the time i'm not yeah. sure maybe it's just because i'm not used to it i think it's something you just get used to over time it's it's for me also the fashion aspect i oh I sure really yeah like pulling out coats. different outfits and yeah like coats jackets yeah man. sweatshirts like um you know the, to me like during the summer I mean, people who watch the Fine Duke will see I'm like always in a dry fit during mm-hmm. the summer episodes. I'm just sitting here because it's just way more breathable. But like, here we are. It's February. I'm in a hoodie and sweatpants. Uh, like I, I like breaking out different seasons of clothing and putting others away. 
uh that's like and i maybe and that's another thing that may have just been like grandfathered into me like you know i grew up with those cycles right so it's just you know like okay time to put all the winter coats away we don't need them in the closets they're taking mm. up space let's put all the the, the t-shirts and like light jackets out right now because you know we, we've only moved in reason recently considering you know this last seven months um where it's like we just everything's kind of out and in the closets and whatnot but eventually we'll get into that and, and it's like you know that's i always enjoyed that like i look forward to you know i i always wear a flannel in the winter mm. it's like that was one of those things where like i enjoy seeing i'm like ah oh, it's t- it's time for the flannel and it, i don't know it creates like some sort of regulation in my life i guess like sure. i think it's a really important i feel like if i took that away and i moved to like california i'd be so fucking out of sorts i'd be like <laughs> shorts and t-shirt again <laughs> shorts yeah. and t-shirt again yeah you could do that like six months out of the year easily yeah. but i think us californians are just so not used to actual cold weather so you know you see people dressed up here but it's like not really that cold for you guys you'd just be like uh yeah you wouldn't like, be I- wearing shorts and a t-shirt no, like that's it's it's interesting to see that difference too. I'm, I'm sure Colin, because you started off on the East Coast and probably experienced it, but like when I was at E3 and you know it was like 50, so I don't know, it was like not super warm out, and some people were like, "Man, it's cold," and I'm like standing there in shorts and t-shirt. And yeah, like, the fuck are you talking about? I'm like, yeah, I'm glad I never had like- to do. I'm never. I'm also glad I never had to do E3 during my SSRI sweating period because that would have mm. been a, been a disaster. Oh my god, yeah, around. dude. Yeah. Jesus, um, yeah, that would suck ass. Yeah, man. it was just so it would. I'd be that would have been game over for me. I'm thankful that I didn't have to experience that because yeah, sometimes you'd get like a really pleasant LA at E3, and then sometimes you'd get a fucking horrifying LA. Um, yeah. As far as the weather is concerned, I don't miss that at all. By the way, what do you guys think about this IGN show that they're gonna do? Yeah, what, what is that like? Fest? They're yeah. doing like a fan fest thing. Are yeah, you, I don't. I'm confused. Is it for like their staff, or is it like you meet their staff, or is it? I think it's like supposed to be bigger than that. You hmm. know, a way so to like kind maybe, of maybe like game dev stuff, like meeting yeah. game devs. Yeah, I think like showing games. Okay, having devs and publishers over or whatever, like some smaller footprint, but probably. And I think I saw someone note this, so I'm not the only one that had this thought. It's just it's a necessary thing for IGN to try to do to diversify their their revenue streams at this point and oh, yeah with the decl- with the destruction of kind of like e3 and read pop kind of fading i think in packs not being as con- nearly as consequential as it used to be um, right in my opinion uh maybe it's time for something new i just yeah i thought that was pretty interesting that is interesting i'm curious do they have like a personality or personalities that are big there i don't really know anyone at ign not, I mean, I would at the think last the only... standing one here. <laughs> what were you thinking? Yeah. I'm saying you're looking at the last standing one right yeah. here. It was, yeah, yeah, I guess when you you guys kind of left, that was kind of the end, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, yeah. I think the only for me, it, it's like Ryan McCaffrey is still big. Yeah, and mm, Destin's right. pretty big. Damon, I would think that that Damon Hatfield, I would think that that's probably about it. That's why I I, I was uh, on Sacred Symbols when we were talking about the unionization drive at IGN. I wanted to talk to them. I emailed them to get them mm-hmm. on the show but they didn't want to come on i have no problem with private unions at all so that's not a thing but i'm like is this really the wisest thing for you guys to do when you have it's like we really should have been the ones to unionize right um i don't know that they really care if half of you left to be honest so they yeah. probably like it in fact i also found out from a person who worked at ign recently he doesn't he doesn't work there anymore that like two-thirds of their traffic comes from wikis so oh, yeah yeah so they are so that's bad news that. for a unionization yeah. drive i believe that yeah because you're just a cog. If you don't ha- if you don't stand out in any way, you're very replaceable. So yeah, I agree. And I wonder. Um. So yeah, I, I, that that's just a random question because we were talking about E3, but I was I was thinking about that that IGN and hmm. see how that goes. Um. Are we satisfied though with the topics, my friends? Yeah, I hmm. I learned a lot about you guys, just kind of your personalities, and it was really cool just to find out more about you know settings i don't really i'm not super familiar with because you know we're all over the united states which is cool about this company i really like that actually Mm. so i get a lot of cool perspectives like even when uh day and you is going on vacation in florida you're talking about like everyone it seems like everyone i know from the east coast like everyone goes to florida and i was just like what is it about florida that everyone just flocks to and i guess it's just Uh, yeah i've been there once in orlando i think it was for a universal trip with my fiance and it just I don't get the Florida hype. Uh, everyone loves Florida. I don't get it. I'm like, yeah. this is this is basically like Australia Junior here. You've got <laughs> wildlife ready to fucking kill you. 
got a lot of crazy people here. Like if, there's that, that very true thing. I, I think I saw it on Twitter or something where it's like, if you Google a crime and then put Florida and it, it exists, like just all this shit happens in Florida. Like anything you can imagine, just type in Florida and it, there's a story. It's ridiculous. Hmm. There's also oh. the, the, um, the idea, Brad, are you familiar with the term snowbird? Yeah. So like, that's where people from where Maddie and I are from go to live oh, yeah. when they're older. And I think that causes a lot of travel. Then people kind of stay there. Obviously, like you said, yeah. Maddie, Orlando's there. So you have Disney World and Universal and other things. And then Miami is like a huge party right. city. Yeah. And then you have the Keys, which are great vacation spots. And there's just there's a lot in Florida. I think it's mm-hmm. just the most accessible domestic pseudo vacation spot that attracts yeah. people from the tri-state and from New England. Because I've been in Florida, I don't know, six or seven times in my life I've for arbitrarily. I have no idea why I've even been there half the time. So hmm. I totally, so I totally <laughs> you agree. up there. <laughs> yeah, like you just, it's like I've been to Disney World probably five times, I think, something like that in my life, all uh-huh. before I was 18. Because like you would just go, it would be fairly affordable to fly mm-hmm. down there. And yeah, you would just, you would just go. I don't know, but I don't know exactly what else. I think it's just a confluence of things being available there and people kind of relocating there. No income tax, right? So people move there. Yeah, that's true. Um, It's good shit. Florida's good shit. Uh, I believe it. And and Maddie, to your point, shout out to the Florida man. You know, like. Shout out Florida, dude. Yeah. I I love Florida man and I love, I miss cops so much the show because it was just (laughs) such, it was just so Florida and and it was exported around the world and everyone thinks Florida's nuts. And I love that. Yeah. It's not nearly as crazy as people think it is, but oh, of course, right. but it's, but it's funny that that was exported so heavily. It was just so much Florida mm-hmm. in that show. Fascinating. So, state. So sh- yeah. But it is different out here on the East and the West. What would be like the, vac- like the, for the West? Yeah. Like Palm Springs, San Diego, maybe Hawaii people. Hawaii, go to yeah. Okay. Hawaii. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, because you're kind of already living in a nice subtropical place anyway. You don't really yeah. need to go anywhere for a while. Yeah, I guess it's like technically like Mediterranean, I would say, maybe around here yeah. where I'm at. Yeah, you're in Orange County. So, mm-hmm. yeah, very nice. Well, this was a fun and pretty brisk episode, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm surprised. Yeah, good I guess topics. Most of the episodes I'm on have Jaffe, so I feel like they always go on a little bit. Longer <laughs> compared to what oh, I'm yeah, yeah. Like, he can go I on. Was like, yeah, it makes more sense. I was like, yeah, why does this feel so short? Ah, now I got it. Well, no, he, yeah, Jaffe... <laughs> He's got a. It's funny, like his chaos, his chaotic way of podcasting actually speaks to me a great deal. I like it. It's like a yin to my yang in some sense. But uh, some people are turned off by it, and I'm like, that's just too bad. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, no, no. I, I hope too bad. Didn't come across oh no, 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 no. I'm not saying yeah. you're saying that at yeah. all. I'm, I'm just noting. No, no, not anything you're saying at all. I'm just noting. Generally speaking, he brings a level of chaos to the yeah. show that I yeah. personally embrace. You know? Yeah, you gotta embrace it sometimes. It's good to have that every now and then. Like I can't I mean, wait I think to have it's, him on it's, some time. He's gonna 100 percent bro. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's healthy. It's healthy, I think, because you just he he definitely finds a mold and just fucking breaks it over his knee every time. Yeah. Certainly. Anytime you feel safe, Jaffe is lurking, ready to strike. Yeah, certainly. Right. He's a very interesting person. And I don't know <laughs> yeah. that people I say this as a friend of his, obviously, for a long time, but I don't think people realize how cool it is to have access to a person like that, the way he gives access to him. You know? Mm-hmm. He doesn't have to be doing any of this. He does it because he wants to. Right. Jaffe is very is just fine. <laughs> you know, like he he's doing that this out of metal money. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That twisted, twisted metal, metal guy where he was a fellow. He was a the fucking creative director. You know, yeah. Um, I think people kind of take that for granted and almost abuse him in some way. And I, I get I get I'm bummed by that because it's like yeah. it's like him and Cliffy B to an extent are like accessible people wherein a lot of people are in these ivory towers or simply don't want to talk. To mm-hmm. others about their experiences and i think people take that for granted they shouldn't so i'm glad to have him on on board with us and we'll get him on summon sign soon no doubt about it my friends it's good to see you guys dagan's already gone so we don't have to say goodbye to him let's say goodbye to you brad have a good weekend we're recording this on a friday as usual uh, any big yeah. plans this weekend uh probably just gaming as far mm-hmm. as i'm aware yeah gotta play more persona nice just, uh, maybe i'll try to go outside do something outside. I like to go outside at least like once a day and do something, you know, mm. I don't want to get stuck in my house all day. So sure. definitely got to find something to do out there. I mean, meaning to say too, you have the classic California bedroom mirror mm-hmm. doors on your sliding doors. Like that's such a yeah, California. That is so is, California. Yeah. yeah. It's so California. I love it. Um, yeah. I miss, I miss like, it's just funny. Like everywhere I lived had that like yeah. for 10 years. Yeah. It's a staple. Um, yeah, it is. I don't know why. Very interesting though. Maddie, goodbye to you. Any big plans this weekend? This is actually a busy weekend for me. Yeah, yeah. I um, 
I'm reviewing a game. So oh. whenever I got time to kind of filter that in, I do. But having a couple of friends stay the night Saturday, uh, we're going to watch the UFC card and nice. they live about an hour away. So they're just going to they're just going to crash the night. So, yeah, we get we did some shopping going to do a little house cleaning later today after we install a couple of things um, today. And then um, Sunday, I'm going to my parents. Uh, the The Rangers are doing a stadium series game. So we're just going to hang out, watch, watch that. Cool. And uh, yeah, yeah. My last two weekends were dominated by the boys. I watched seasons one and two already. So I just got one season left once mm. the catch up is done. Um, so this will be a more active social <laughs> weekend for me, which is nice. a, good, which is a rarity. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to it. Very nice. Excited. Yeah, I have to go out. Uh, we we Mike and I have been going out on Fridays for dinner, but we're not going to go out tonight. So we're just gonna you went stay to home. Cracker Barrel, dude. I saw yeah, Cracker Barrel on Valentine's Day for lunch. Yeah, it was. Uh, how so romantic. Did, yeah, did you, know, you eat it was more great. than you, you ate more than once for the day? Yeah, I, more than I, one I, meal. Yeah, the day before. Uh, it, right, I did. I I did, and it was funny because we were there, and I'm like, I'm really not hungry because. Um, <laughs> The day before, I was saying to Michael, Michael loves Cracker Barrel, and I was just joking around. We had we got like a gift card from someone for it. I'm like, we should just go for Valentine's Day tomorrow for like mm-hmm. lunch because Michael cooks dinner for us. So we uh, for Valentine's Day, so we were going to do that anyway. And she, so we thought that was a cute idea. But yeah, when I was there, I was like, I'm not really. Usually, I go to like the heaviest things, like the biggest things on a menu, and and this, I'm looking for like a light. So I yeah. got like a couple pancakes and like some eggs. And I didn't even finish that it. Doesn't sound light at that doesn't sound like it. It was it was six hundred <laughs> calories. It said on the menu. Okay. Okay. All right. And hey, I was like, all right, so I can good. I can deal with this. And I didn't even finish it, but yeah, it was good. It was good. Yeah. It was a mausoleum. Mm. Like it, it, it's incredible. So Micah, I'm thirty nine. Micah's thirty. She must have been the, the youngest person right. there. I would think, other than yeah, maybe my some of the white stuff. Loved Cracker Barrel. So that 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 lines up with my personal lore. Yeah, we I uh for for me and Laylee celebrated Valentine's early because we weren't sure how available I'd be with like because we we were we actually based our Valentine's plans around defining Duke and like which is on a Wednesday we were like uh <laughs> you know like we don't know when Xbox is gonna talk yeah. and I yeah you know, we were, I was I told her I was like you know our, our anniversary is next month That's anyway so we don't put a lot of value in 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 Valentine's Day but yeah on Sunday I I made us crunch wraps she helped a ton but, wow make crunch wraps dude nice, fucking dude. awesome yeah there's recipes online because so, i love taco bell's crunch wrap supreme i think it's so good but like i don't really eat fast food anymore so um, mm. just, we kind of had this collective craving i was like let's try to make it dude it's these recipes online got it perfectly dude Damn. i don't eat i don't eat fast food either anymore it's so strange i used to really love eating out oh and fast food um <laughs> and I, I just don't Mike is great. I mean, she's she cooks all. Yeah, you know, she loves cooking. Us. Yeah, so and she's she's baking all the time. She's gonna make me into a fucking morbidly obese man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't I don't rely on the fast food like I used to at all. Yeah. I don't think I've had. I'm not sure I've had fast food this year. Uh, actually, uh, which is strange, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah. it's because you got a wife that'll cook for you all the mm-hmm. time, dude. My wife. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your wife, dude, Maddie. It's funny you brought Taco Bell. So the Taco Bell HQ is like five minutes from my house oh cool really and i uh i actually taste tested food there before a couple of times <laughs> You're back a in the day <laughs> yeah dude i had like some coffee there before it was fucking good dude oh. <laughs> and they, they like never brought it that. out though i was pissed i love that and, like That's some of awesome. the taco bells by me are like experimental ones they have one. Oh, so you, yeah, you got to stop near, by often then. yeah they have one near a, the beach and it's called like a cantina it's like a more fancy taco bell not quite like Demolition Man style Taco Bell, but it's a little more fancy. Yeah, it's weird. So define fancy Taco Bell. <laughs> Is it uh, the food presentation or like the, the table? The and theming, area? yes. The theming, the tables. Got yeah, it. it's a little more classy looking. <laughs> but yeah, it's fucking wild, man. Did your high school in Orange County, was it like an open air high school? Yeah. yeah, did yeah. You, Have did you, you seen ha- Gleaming the Cube, the movie? No. My no. high school's in that movie. That's the high school he goes oh, to cool. in it. Hmm. so i was just gonna ask like did you did you have like a great cafeteria with like external no. foods no no okay we so at my high school we could go off campus to eat and that's what most kids did we just walk somewhere oh interesting. Wow. They, they, never, they never allowed us to do that like yeah, if you left the walk. school doors they were like they would tag you and just be like no get back <laughs> oh yeah you could leave our school easily that's just, crazy wow just need a parent's approval and that's it yeah yeah i think when you were a junior and a senior you could leave my school like to go but you had because you had oh, to drive okay. to get to anywhere you know yeah like, food we could, had, like, there was stuff period. that you could there was stuff you could walk to by my school so nice. everyone would do that 
Nice. Yeah, that was just a random question. Yeah, it's so interesting. The the I, I tell people about it like the the phenomenon of the open air school and specifically open air malls mm-hmm. is like unheard of where we're where I'm from and where Maddie's mm-hmm. from. It's like not a thing. You have yeah. strip malls and stuff, but there's that Santa Monica Third Street promenade or whatever. I lived right near that. And I was like, this is so crazy because it's an, it's just a mall, but it's there's no roof on it. It's not outside. It's just so much more airy and you feel like you're Oh, not. yeah. Those are yeah. so popular, yeah. Here, man. Yeah, it's cool. All right. Let's get the hell out of here, my friends. It's good to be all here right. with you guys. Thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Last Day Media, uh, Constellation, Sacred Symbols, Defining Duke, etc. Get it all early and ad-free over on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Last Day Media. Couldn't do without you over there. We're at an all-time high right now. It's the Bradley Ellis effect, I think. We're going to continue to just no. blame it on you. Blame you for it. <laughs> How um, dare you? <laughs> merch, lastdaymedia.store. That's basically it. We'll see you next time. Dagan will be back, I'm sure. Until then, goodbye. Constellation is a product of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show was conceived by and is directed and hosted by me, Colin Moriarty. My co host is my brother, Dagan Moriarty. The show is produced by Last Stand's executive producer, Dustin Furman and is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All Last Stand theme music is by Ramon Narvaez, and all of our graphics and logos are by Dagan Moriarty. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's podcasts, including Constellation, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest support tier, and we're infinitely grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. 